time now for France 24's ongoing special coverage of the French presidential debate. Set to start in just 15 minutes' time, incumbent Emmanuel Macron will face off against his far-right rival, Marine Le Pen, in a televised duel. The two will discuss eight themes as they look to woo hesitant voters ahead of the second and final round of voting on Sunday. Well, joining me here in the studio for analysis, I have our French politics editor, Mark Perlman, our business editor, Kate Moody, our Europe editor, Catherine Nicholson, and our international affairs commentator, Doug Herbert. But well, before we begin, let's hear this clip from Emmanuel Macron, who just spoke to France 24 before heading into the debate studio. How do you feel today? Very good. Happy to be here. An important moment for you? Yes, of course, for us all. Now, Mark, uh, let's start with you. The second round is just days away now. What are the latest opinion polls showing us? They're showing a sizable lead for Emmanuel Macron, 56.5% uh, versus 43.5% uh, for Marine Le Pen. So a 13-point lead. It's a sizable lead, a commanding lead, if you will. Uh, the lead has doubled in the, the last 10 days since round one. Uh, so clearly, Emmanuel Macron has uh, the edge over Marine Le Pen. Uh, obviously, it's still a poll, but all the polls have shown that he uh, really has made a difference in the 10 days that he has campaigned. Some would say that he didn't campaign before, so uh, this is now really the time to uh, campaign. But so he enters uh, the debate with this sizable advantage. As we discussed in some of our previous coverage, uh, these presidential debates play a large role in French presidential campaigns. Why is this one so important? Well, it's important because uh, it was a very peculiar campaign. Some might say there was no real campaign because of COVID, because of the war in Ukraine, because of Emmanuel's decision to throw his hat into the ring very, very uh, late. Uh, so, in fact, uh, the previous campaign, there were uh, a number of debates, and I remember them because I covered them, uh, you know, primary debates, uh, the left, the right, and there was no debate during this campaign. So people are actually going to learn a lot about what the candidates really think. Obviously, they were already there in 2017, but nevertheless, uh, some of their campaign positions are not well known by the French, and especially, especially by the undecided voters. Those are the voters both candidates need to court because uh, Emmanuel Macron scored 28% in the first round, Marine Le Pen 23%, so uh, they need a lot of votes uh, to really uh, win uh, this coming uh, Sunday. And so this is why it's uh, important uh, for both of them. It's more important, obviously, for Marine Le Pen because of the polls we just discussed, because she needs to make something happen tonight. She needs to pull off an upset with Emmanuel Macron. She lost badly. She admitted she messed up last time. She was not well prepared. She was too tired and she was not good, simply not good. And she thought Emmanuel Macron, who was a political rookie at the time, she would essentially destabilize him. It backfired badly. Uh, but she need not only to essentially rise up to the occasion, she really needs to make sure she wins that debate decisively to be able to be uh, maybe president next Sunday. Well, let's hear from our business editor now. Kate, one of the main issues of this campaign has been cost of living. Why is that the biggest issue this time around? Well, the number one issue for more than 60 percent of voters in that first round, and little has changed in that regard. Uh, France is facing its highest levels of inflation since the late 1990s. Just a little snapshot of the data. In March, consumer prices were 5.1 percent higher than they were a year earlier. Energy prices were nearly 30 percent higher. Food prices, 3 percent higher. Uh, now, if we break it down, what that means for French voters, for households, a recent poll by Ipsos uh, says that actually 65 percent of French voters are the most worried about energy prices. Uh, more than half of them are also worried about overall inflation. You can see here pensions, taxes, wages and social inequality round off that list of what specific areas are real sources of concerns for French households. Um, it is worth saying that the French economy is in fairly good shape despite these record high inflation figures. Uh, it's recovering from the pandemic with a forecast to grow around 7 percent this year. Uh, it has 7.4 percent unemployment. That's the lowest in 13 years. 
But it's really those inflation numbers that has everyone worried. And what would we hear from the two candidates tonight uh, regarding this issue of the cost of living? Well, we've already heard a lot from Marine Le Pen on this issue. It's been at the center of her recent campaigning, uh, although it is worth pointing out that on her official campaign website, at least, uh, this issue is only fourth in her list of pledges. Uh, immigration and security remain top of her agenda. Her headline proposal, though, on the cost of living is to reduce sales tax on petrol, gas, energy from its current 20 to 5 and half percent. She wants to remove it altogether from about 100 essential items. Uh, she also wants to bring France's highways back under national control. She says that would help her allow to lower tolls, help drivers there. Uh, some economists have argued that her proposals would simply be too expensive and that they would drive the French state further into debt. Uh, debt already stands at about 113 percent of GDP after all that pandemic spending. Now, we heard, heard a lot more from Emmanuel Macron as president on this issue than as a campaigner. Uh, we know that his government has capped increases in electricity and gas bills. They've offered an energy subsidy for vulnerable households. Uh, they've imposed a rebate on liters of gas, of petrol rather. Um, his government says that those measures have cost around 25 billion euros so far. The National Statistics Office says that it's already brought down inflation by one and a half percentage points. Um, his campaign has been more focused on reducing taxes, tripling the amount of a tax-free bonus that employers can offer. But he might be pushed for much more concrete and immediate immediate measures in this debate. Uh, we're also going to be seeing this divide because Marine Le Pen has been painted as sort of the champion of the working class, the people who are suffering the most in, in this particular crisis, while he's painted, of course, as the president of the rich. We're going to have to see what concrete proposals they both come out with and how they push each other on those. All right. Well, let's pivot uh, to Europe now. Catherine Nicholson is our Europe editor. And Catherine, the two candidates have starkly different visions of the EU. They absolutely do. Emmanuel Macron has said that this second round vote it amounts to a referendum on Europe. And in some ways, uh, he's right, even though in uh, most of the polling that we've looked at, the European Union is nobody's top priority. Um, so looking at Emmanuel Macron's uh, vision for Europe, he had, uh, you know, lots of EU flags at his, his rallies, symbolic things like that. Um, but he says he wants to shake up the European Union uh, and refound it. He's profoundly pro-European Union, very anti-Brexit. In terms of concrete measures that he wants, he wants uh, much more investment in uh, the green transition uh, within Europe. He wants the EU to refuse to sign any free trade deals that uh, are with states that haven't signed up to the Paris Climate Accords. He wants to move towards a European army, something that was quite controversial for a long time until uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. It's been gaining support. He wants to tax digital giants across the EU, companies like Google, Amazon, Facebook, companies that are seen as making a lot of money in Europe but not paying a lot of tax here. He wants to create a true EU asylum policy, as he calls it. Uh, there has been a package on the table for a couple of years, but the EU member states are not coming together around this. And he says this is the way to tackle issues with immigration. There are also measures to do with women's rights, uh, boosting educational exchanges, the Erasmus program that some of our viewers will know, uh, and much more. Now, Marine Le Pen, on the other hand, in terms of Europe, uh, she was for a long time known as somebody who espoused Frexit, leaving the European Union. She and her party officially dropped that policy a few years back and uh, in 2019 also dropped their policy of wanting to leave the euro currency, saying that they realise voters no longer want this. But when you look into what she's talking about doing in her programme, a lot of it amounts to huge challenges to the European Union as it currently functions. So to cite a couple of uh, things, uh, this France first policy of Marine Le Pen, she wants people who are French citizens to have priority in certain things such as social housing, also certain uh, job applications, uh, also in terms of uh, benefits, uh, social benefits. And now this would really go against the EU's free movement rules, which is one of the fundamental pillars of how the European Union and its single market functions. She wants to slash France France's EU budget contributions. France is the second biggest overall contributor to the budget. It is also the second biggest country in the EU. Uh, she wants uh, French laws to have primacy over EU laws uh, in all circumstances. Again, a massive challenge to the way that the EU functions. How can they have harmony among this supposed union? if each country is allowed to do whatever it wants uh, in every single instance. So a lot of people in Brussels are looking at Marine Le Pen in the second round with a certain degree of concern. What 
would her going into the Elysee mean for the European Union? There's not a lot of optimism, to say the least. Now, Catherine, before we hear from Doug, just one last question for you. You know, one of the biggest crises currently facing Europe right now is the war in Ukraine. How have Macron and Le Pen responded to Russia's invasion? Well, I think I've just had a little preview by accident earlier of a couple of pictures that I wanted to show them of Emmanuel Macron and Marine Le Pen meeting Vladimir Putin in different circumstances. So first up, we had Macron meeting Putin in Russia just a couple of weeks ago across that huge table that everyone remembers. Uh, this is part of his efforts as the president of France uh, to have some dialogue and mediation with Vladimir Putin. Uh, Macron has condemned the invasion, the violence against civilians, uh, and he's had several phone conversations conversations with Vladimir Putin as well. Some have questioned whether it was worth it, but Macron says this dialogue was important uh, without necessarily, of course, this being a show of support for Vladimir Putin. He wanted to keep the channels open, he said. Um, Macron did say earlier on in about 2019 that he wanted to push a reset button with Russia and try and find more productive relations uh, with Vladimir Putin. He's not ever gone as far as Marine Le Pen, however, who, as somebody who is as we said, not the president of France. She did, however, visit Moscow, visited uh, Vladimir Putin. This is a picture from 2017. They had a very cordial meeting and just uh, around the time of the last presidential election, in fact. Uh, and uh, this picture was in uh, over a million Marine Le Pen campaign leaflets, which were pulped just a few weeks ago because her, her party obviously recognised that this is not the image they want to put out at a time of Russian war on Ukraine. Marine Le Pen, so she does condemn the war war uh, against Ukraine, but she has also said some things that are extremely controversial, such as that uh, the, uh, the annexation of Crimea and the referendum that Russia held uh, to confirm that. She says that that's fine. It was, in fact, declared invalid at the United Nations. So she's saying it's OK, but there's a large proportion of the world that's saying it's not OK. All right. Thanks, Catherine. Now we just have a couple of minutes before the debate starts, but we're going to hear from our international affairs commentator, oh, yeah. Doug. Yeah, speaking of foreign policy, it's the second issue in tonight's debate, uh, the debate that's going to be watched by many in the international community. Tell us about the foreign policy. Well, well first of all, Marine Le Pen has done everything she can, with the exception of one foreign policy press conference, to avoid talking about foreign policy. She knows, even if she doesn't really want to let on that it's her Achilles heel, she has never really been an elected official, you know, on national stage in France. She has never uh, uh, been part of the government. She has very little international experience, to, despite those notorious meetings or her, her smiling handshake with Putin back in 2017. Look, in a nutshell, the reason so many people are worried, not just in Europe but beyond, is because we've been at this juncture right now. In the past, you know, 5, 10, even 15 years, this battle, if you will, an ideological battle between this notion of illiberal democracy and democracy. And some people have even been questioning whether or not democracy still has a lease on life. Can it still survive? Uh, and what you have is a prospect right now, and a not a far-fetched prospect, despite, you know, the polls widening with, with, with Macron taking an edge there, uh, whatever you want to believe in the polls. Uh, you have the prospect of a Putin-friendly, Russia-friendly leader taking the helm of the European Union's second biggest economy, and it's, let's not forget, it's sole nuclear power. She may try to disguise her real feelings about Europe, uh, and about basically multilateral, multilateral institutions as much as she will. She's masquerading as someone who would be sort of harmless with the world's institutions, uh, that she has no, she's not going to take a, a hammer blow to any of them. The, the, the fact of the matter is, at the end of the day, she um, has an agenda which has not really changed. She has, in my view, gaslit a lot of her uh, voters and the, and the French electorate on these issues. A lot of them are either angry or misinformed, and they're willing to sort of look beyond that, or they're willing to swallow her narrative whole. But you have, as one political analyst put it right now, you have an election right now in a debate tonight where the real question being asked is, do you hate Emmanuel Macron more than you fear uh, Marine Le Pen? And it's a pretty sad commentary on the state of affairs, not just in France, but, you know, in a wider level when it comes down to such a sort of negative approach uh, in such a consequential uh, moment of French history and really European history. Doug, the debate is uh, set to start any moment now, but just one last uh, question for you. You touched on it briefly there. Marine Le Pen has worked on softening her image, yes. but her platform does remain staunchly far right. Yeah, her platform remains very much xenophobic. I mean, we're not going to go into the whole immigration debate here. Um, you 
we can expect tonight that she will do absolutely everything possible to make herself look moderate, to show French voters that she is the smiley, smiling, happy, innocent, harmless face uh, of, of conservative French politics. She's always rejected the far right label. She wants nothing to do with it. The fact of the matter is she remains very much far right. And in, for her detractors, xenophobic xenophobic and, and, and very much disinforming uh, her, her constituents when it comes to the issues. All right. Well, thank you all for participating in this. The debate is starting right now. Bonsoir et bienvenue à tous pour ce grand débat du second tour de l'élection présidentielle. Big debate, round two of the presidential election, eagerly awaited. Hello, Gilles. Good evening, Léa. Good evening, Madame, Madame Le Pen, Emmanuel Macron. Good evening. Two and a half hours today to set out your plan, your vision of France, what separates you, but also your personality. So, the ground rules. We're here with Gilles to really... Be strict timekeepers and the clocks are there. We're also to make sure that the debate is impartial, clear, and you're responsible for what you say, the numbers, the facts, the dates that you'll give, and your opponent will be able to challenge those. So we'll discuss the place of France in Europe and the world, whereas the war in Ukraine is raging. We'll talk about the environment, keenly awaited by the young people watching us, health, hospitals, pensions, the appeal of France, law and order, immigration. We're asking what president you will be and how you will exercise power. Let's start with the number one concern of French people for months now, purchasing power. Let's start Marine Le Pen. Um, you've drawn the right to speak first. Could I interrupt you, please, just to remind you that uh, we'd like to allow you one minute thirty to answer the following question. You have 90 seconds, both of you. Marine Le Pen, starting in what way would you be a better president than your opponent? Are you saying I was after a polling start? We haven't removed the seconds. I apologize for that. I was simply saying that uh, France's greatest asset is its people, a people who shows solidarity, who is strong, creative. I know our people. I've been meeting with the people of France for many years, but I have to attest to the fact that for the past five years, I have seen the people of France worry, suffer, worry about being downclassed. The sense of general insecurity. I have seen the people of France worry about the future and feel a lot of doubt. I want to say that another choice is possible, which is based on respect and common sense. If the people of France does me the honor of trusting me next Sunday, I will be the president that will preside over a renaissance era. We will restore our freedoms, our security. I will also preside over values such as work, purchasing power, schooling, knowledge, health care everywhere across the board and for every member of the French population. I believe in Republican assimilation, also believe in the social ladder, but mostly I will be I will be the president of justice, of restored concord between the French, the president of a national fraternity of civil peace. Brotherhood is what holds the French people together. We need to rally around a collective platform so we can all Thank see you, the Marine together. Le Pen. Same question for Emmanuel uh, Macron. <coughs> 90 seconds. If you're re-elected, in what way would you be a better president than your opponent? 
Good evening, and good evening to Madame Le Pen, and good evening to our fellow citizens who are listening in and watching us this evening. Tonight is a very important moment where we can uh, clarify our uh, projects for the country and make choices in the next few days. You've just uh, reminded us, Madame, that uh, we have gone through difficult times, crises, pandemics, uh, something that we hadn't experienced for a hundred years. And now we have war once again in Europe. Clearly, we are talking of a time when there are fears, when there are concerns. At the helm of our country, thanks to the trust that the people had put in me, I uh, have uh, steered through these times trying to make the right choices. I believe that we can and uh, will make our country stronger, more independent through economics, through innovation, research, culture. I also believe that we, we can and we must improve uh, the daily lives of our fellow citizens, working on schools and health, and also care uh, for the elderly so that everyone's lives can be it can become better. I also believe that France, as we know it, will become stronger if it tackles the environmental issues and becomes a great environmental power of the 21st century, and also by strengthening Europe. We have done this over the last few years, and this is even more important at a time like this. Uh, these are the first few words uh, to introduce what we'll do in the next few years. So let's begin with the first topic of this debate, purchasing power, cost of living. <coughs> Prices are spiraling upwards, especially during the war in Ukraine. The French people see it when they're shopping, when they put fuel in their cars or pay their energy bills. Marine Le Pen, you can speak first. Inflation that is likely to be established over time. What will you do in practical terms to help the French people? First of all, I have to act as the spokesman, the spokesperson for the French people. Together with your government, I heard you praise yourselves for increasing purchasing power for the French people. But all I hear from uh, the French is that their purchasing power has gone down, that they can't make ends meet, that they're having a hard time, that they're struggling. And 70% of the French population believe that they have lost purchasing power of the past five years. So you have made choices. The carbon tax, for example, has uh, uh, increased the price of gasoline. You have chosen to reduce handouts that were so key to helping the French, uh, for example, housing uh, benefits. Now, my priority will be to restore those handouts. And there are three drivers. For example, I will reduce unavoidable expenditure, and this means reducing taxes. My proposition is to sustainably reduce those taxes, not via checks, vouchers, or rationing. Reduce VAT on all energy uh, uh, prices. Reduce VAT from 20% to 5.5%, because I do believe that energy is a commodity. So this means electricity, gas, fuel, diesel. So 12 billion euros will be returned to the French people. I will also restore their purchasing power by reducing taxes. The half tax share, which has been taken away from widows and widowers, will be given back to them. Families will receive a full tax share as soon as they have a second child. That way, this will improve their purchasing power by 560 euros per year. I will also support work as a value, and this means increasing uh, wages for first-liners, teachers, healthcare workers. I also want to support work, study, contracts, apprenticeship programs. They will receive between 200 and 300 euros in supplemental income. And the last area in which I absolutely want to do something is to support the vulnerable who have been hard hit over the past five years. Policies for the vulnerable need to be improved. And this means handouts, allowances, the single parent families. I want to increase the uh, the allowance for adults with disabilities 
Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the system, in actual fact, say, you have decided to oppose, you have decided to, uh, to oppose a granting of this disability, irrespective of how much the spouse makes, and also indexation of retirement pensions. The least I can say is that this has not been the rule over the past five years. There has been no indexation of retirement pensions on inflation. So these will be my absolute priorities over the next five years. Return to the French their purchasing power. And all of these measures will, on average, will increase the purchasing power per month by 500 600 euros per household. But of course, choices have to be made. Politics is all about making choices. And I'm making choices. I choose to generate savings on superfluous expenditure or harmful expenditure. When money slips through our fingers because nobody has ever done anything about it. Marine Le Pen, you've devoted four minutes. Um, Emmanuel Macron, same question. What will you do? What do you pledge to do to help the French people on this specific point of purchasing power? Well, first of all, Madame Le Pen is quite right to mention the numbers of figures that I didn't uh, uh, pull out, uh, but that uh, independent or bodies have set up that indeed the purchasing power of the working classes and um, the um, uh, workers have uh, increased. But there is a, an issue at the end of the month, of course, and I agree what, with what you said. I've heard the same thing um, over my various trips across the country, the 600 trips I have uh, made over the last five years, people complaining about uh, how difficult it is to to make your weekly shop, to pay for your groceries. Now, as uh, Madame Le Pen uh, said, there's an issue with uh, energy prices, and I want to uh, impose a, a cap, a, a cap on uh, prices, and I think that's twice as effective as dropping VAT. In fact, uh, the uh, French will experience an increase of their uh, gas bills by a couple dozen or maybe 100 euros a year um, because you're, you voted against this cap. Um, and uh, that just leads to a number of difficulties. So I would preserve this uh, cap for as long as the crisis is raging. Uh, the only difference or the other difference there is with you is that it's twice as effective, as I said, but it's not sustainable, as you rightly said. This is a crisis uh, management mechanism. When we get to no more normal times, uh, our, we will not um, subsidize oil and gas that we do not uh, pr produce, but in fact, we will help households uh, change their vehicles and go for electric vehicles, for instance, and we've already started doing that. Second thing, uh, work, labor. I'm proud to see that we together have been able to uh, uh, create 1.2 million um, payment slips. I mean, I was looking at your uh, platform and there's no mention of unemployment. Um, clearly, that means that there's no issue, that you're recognizing the hard work that we put in over the last five years. But uh, the best way to fight against uh, uh, the loss of um, purchasing power is to uh, fight against uh, um, unemployment. And so we have had 1.2 million uh, French who've gone back to um, work. Uh, Basic uh, minimum pay will uh, um, increase 34 euros a month. Uh, pensions will uh, increase also for uh, as of the summer. We're not going to wait until uh, January 1st. After all, uh, inflation has already before uh, below, um, beyond 4%. Uh, percent. And uh, I want uh, small pensions to be raised up to 1,100 euros, contrary to you who just want us to keep it at 1,000. And there's also something that I tend to call the uh, wage earner dividend. And um, what it means is that when um, businessmen or managers pay dividends, um, and we know what kind of uh, rules apply, uh, that whenever dividends are paid, then other bonuses or uh, dividends should be paid to uh, workers 
There was a uh, bonus that was introduced, or a possibility of a bonus introduced three years ago, capped at a thousand euro, and now it's going to be compulsory. And for uh, basic um, wages and uh, minimum wage, uh, we want to simplify this. That. Uh, this will go across the board and also benefits. Everyone who will uh, be entitled to benefits will get them automatically, which means that there'll be less fraud and less difficulty claiming them. So those are the few measures uh, we have in this respect. As for the disability benefit, it has been increased uh, over the last uh, five years, up at 90 euros a month. And I do hope uh, that we can... Um, avoid the problem that you identified, that someone who uh, can claim disability benefit when they get married uh, with um, with uh, someone who earns a lot of money would lose it. And uh, I believe you weren't there during in Parliament when we discussed this. So we'll get you to respond on minimum wage and pay. You've spoken about employment. I know you want to respond. Would you like to respond? Yes, I would like to rebut. A quick reminder. This blocking measure, I'm not opposed to it, but I want things to be sustainable. I want to exit the uh, EU electricity market, which means spectacular increases in prices. That means reforming, not exiting it, madam. I want things to be sustainable, not a quick fix yes, the way that you do it. This. You voted against the capping. In actual fact, Mr. Macron, who's picking up the tab for your famous cap is the taxpayers. So it's either one or the other. Now, we generate savings elsewhere. You're saying that your cap is more effective than my VAT reduction? No, I want to go back to regulated prices. And this is not something that you want to do, as you well know. And all of these measures will add up. I did the math. 590 uh, euros will be gained for the French people for a vat of fuel. But my main measure in terms of incentivizing businesses, this is what I tell them. If you increase wages by 10 percent up until three minimum wages, I will reduce employer contributions. It's a loss of revenue for the government, yes, but in real life, Mr. Macron, when you go to your bank, we're all in real life. In real life, you go to your bank and you want a loan. They'll ask for your basic salary. They don't care how many bonuses you receive. When you want to rent an apartment, the owner, the landlord, will ask you how much you're making, your basic pay. Because a bonus is not systematic. You may lose it. It's variable pay. So my measure will help improve the daily lives of the French. Yes, but you're not increasing uh, income because you're not playing on wages. But you're not in charge of bonus pay either, Mr. Macron. No, but uh, I'm reducing um, taxes, uh, payroll taxes and taxes. Uh, and I'm making this mechanism compulsory. You wouldn't be increasing the wages by 10 percent. Now, I agree. Uh, yes, there's an issue with the bonus that it's uh, um, a bit random from one year to the next. But what you're saying is also random. Uh, you can't be sure of it. No one can uh, be convinced that this is going to happen. Um, the, the, the president would not decide what the wages are said it very clearly that this is an incentive for businesses. So not a 10 percent increase. There will be an increase. No, you're just so suggesting you have suggested uh, removing taxes on that bonus, but you can make that decision for employers. But look, you're not playing on wages. And I'm not saying I will uh, do impose bonuses. I'm just saying we're removing payroll taxes and, ta and changing taxes. You're trying to say that you will increase wages by 10 percent constantly. I'm just saying it's not true. Some employers will do it. Others won't. If you have an increase in wages over the course of time, yes, it's an extra expense for the uh, company uh, and you're improving your, your living standards, but it's not quite the same thing and everyone must understand it. And I wouldn't want people to think that you'll get a 10% increase with you. Sorry, but 
And to come back to uh, price caps, madam, I'm delighted to hear that you're staying with it, but you voted against it when it was being discussed in Parliament. Because I wish to radically change the system. Yes, but look, you were voted against it. Because I want to return to the French, a system whereby energy prices are the result of their own investments. But that's, no, that's something else. As you can clearly see, if prices are regulated the way they used to be, we would be much less sensitive to current fluctuations in energy prices, which are also the consequence of energy prices being set at EU level, as opposed to in France, as opposed to based on our own production prices, which are very low, which used to fuel competitiveness of French businesses for years. But because there have been a number of ideological errors made by our neighbors, particularly Germany, Germany that is very dependent on Russian gas, and therefore there are many variations in prices as a result of geopolitical difficulties. Allow me to finish. Thank you. I completely agree that an additional measure is necessary. And all of the measures that I just referenced uh, are sustainable. But I also suggest totally removing VAT, so 0% of VAT on a selection of 100 basic products, whether foodstuffs or other basic products, as long as inflation is higher than growth by one point, which is the case at the moment. Is it? Yes, it happens to be the case right now. In forecast numbers or? No. In, you in expectations, in forecast, but also the figures for Q2. Inflation is 4%, and inflation and growth is 6%, as opposed to 2.8% and 4.4% for inflation. So I do believe that this measure will be implemented very quickly. Unfortunately, actually, because this demonstrates that the situation is very difficult. Let me welcome the fact that uh, even though you voted against, as an MP uh, voted against this measure, um, that you seem to be supporting the idea of keeping it, that's a good thing. Um, uh, reforming the European market will not happen overnight. We, we started this, and that difference between us. You said you wanted to withdraw from the European energy market. I think this is a tremendous mistake. We are intertwined. We are interlinked. In some, at some points in time, we import the energy that we do not produce. And because we are interconnected, we need this market. Under uh, our presidency, we um, have launched this, which is why we need to reform Europe and not withdraw from it. Um, and we need to be able to reform the uh, electricity market so that it no longer depends on the um, ad marginal additions of gas, but on the basics of, for instance, nuclear energy. So it will take some time. And even though we have launched this reform, we still need the price cap, uh, and we've done it, and I'm sorry that you voted against it. On VAT on uh, foodstuffs, uh, we um, offer, I offer this uh, um, food check uh, for uh, those who are really on a tight budget for students and uh, some households, of course, and that seems fairer. Why? Because a 0% VAT on foodstuffs is not effective. It really doesn't get much of a pass through. It's something, according to some inst uh, institutes, it's only somewhere around 13 or 15 euros a, a year. But when we dropped a VAT on uh, restaurants, that was a very good thing done by um, Mr. Sarkozy, but it didn't do much about prices. The idea was to get uh, restaurant owners to uh, hire again. And uh, your measure would be beneficial to uh, supermarket chains, not to the consumers. Plus, it's unfair. Why? Because you and I, we don't need to pay 0% VAT on this. We want the people who are really in a tight spot, who really can't pay for their weekly shop, can get some money. And a check makes much more sense than the VAT that was um, something that would apply to and be beneficial to people like us for here who actually don't need it. And when you look at the numbers for the uh, 
um, Banque de France. Uh, there's less than one percentage points difference between inflation and uh, growth. And you mentioned 4.5 percent inflation. I think we need to look at the uh, trim, uh, quarterly uh, uh, growth. And the last one is 5.4 percent. I've just double checked my numbers. Uh, so, there so there's a one point difference. So therefore, the measure will apply. No, 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 no. I think your mechanism wouldn't apply today in the current circumstances. It just won't happen. A few seconds, Madame Le Pen. There's something that I find surprising. You're capping prices, but you could have reduced the taxes after increasing them. We've given back more than that. No, it took you a while before you did that. But we but did it. Remember that you increased fuel taxes which triggered purchasing power problems for the people and also triggered the Yellow Vests movement. And so you suspended that increase. Yes, it was passed in 2015. You did not remove that provision from the law. And this means you're going back to that trajectory of increasing taxes. What I want to do is give the French their money back. So you're writing checks. Let me tell you that they're based on inflation, so always been the case. When you give handouts, when you write checks, it fuels inflation because storekeepers see that it is in their interest to maintain prices high since they're going to get, they're going to get a check anyway. So you're implementing measures that may actually make the situation worse. So I'm sorry to tell you this. But the measures that you are proposing are ineffective sometimes poorly calibrated. The 100 euro check that you sent to a variety of demographics, including detainees, I think it's easier to give people their money back because it is their money in the first place. There are easier ways. Look, uh, I can see that you're not answering my questions quite simply because you don't have an answer. But can I just say that what you've just said is actually wrong. The cap, as the numbers show, means that inflation is uh, half what it is in Spain here in France. Uh, quite simply, uh, it's lower inflation than it is in our neighbors because the cap it does not lead to inflation. That's all it is. So what you're saying is exactly the exact opposite of facts as they stand today. And again, as you've said, your measures will last over time, but are not focused. You're dropping uh, VAT for all four of us here. Uh, but this is ineffective because it doesn't pass through onto prices. This brings us to the end of the first topic. Looking at the clock, you're about the same speaking time. We can move to international relations. Another very important chapter in these circumstances, international relations, the 24th of February last Ukraine, an independent, uh, recognized European country, was invaded and aggressed by Russia. What should France do? How far should France go to help Ukraine, Emmanuel Macron? Well, first of all, I think you have, you're quite right in mentioning first what's happening here in Europe and the fact that war is raging once again on the continent. Uh, the times are very. Uh, serious indeed. Russia has decided to uh, uh, strengthen its offensive over the next few hours, uh, next few days. There will be an increased offensive on eastern Ukraine, on uh, the Donbass, on Mariupol, and uh, this will lead to uh, human disasters as we've already witnessed in a number of cities. France and Europe, as we've been doing from the very beginning, uh, must uh, support Ukraine, support it to resist, to give Ukrainians defensive equipment and fighting equipment to make sure that Kiev doesn't uh, fall. We have to also uh, support them financially by also uh, welcoming uh, the Ukrainians, the five million uh, Ukrainians which have left their country and gone across the country. Well, look, I think we need to do more today and to um, stay tr that course. And we must make sure, as I've been trying to do from the very beginning, that there is no escalation and that the war doesn't spill over. We have, therefore, to tighten our grip 
uh, with uh, the Allies and the Europeans, and we need to uh, have other countries on board, which is why I've been speaking with China, with India, with the Gulf states to make sure that everyone understands that the choices being made by Russia is a disaster for Ukraine, of course, but also for Russia itself. And that's why Europe is so important, a strong Europe, a Europe that can influence uh, a Europe that is strong on defense uh, with a number of its countries, such as France, which is why we, over the last five years, have invested uh, to have a strong uh, army uh, and armed forces in line with the budget set in the white paper. But we also want to make sure that this will ensure our uh, safety and security over the long run, because we are no one's vassals, but we are, must also bring Russia back to reason, first introduce a ceasefire and then release Ukraine. Back to the European Union. I don't think you have the same vision on what the European Union must be. We'll come to that in a moment. Exactly the same question for you, Marine Le Pen. Should we help more Ukraine and deliver weapons to it? Go further. Let me start by addressing my solidarity and my absolute compassion vis-a-vis -vis the Ukrainian people, and we're doing this in front of millions of viewers. Russia's invasion and attack on Ukraine is unacceptable. And Mr. Macron, the efforts you have made to try on behalf of France to come up with ways and means to secure peace, your efforts deserve our support, clearly. Should we help Ukraine? Of course. Humanitarian aid? Of course. Financial aid? Yes, of course. Defense equipment? Yes, of course. Needless to say, as you well know, Louis Alliot, mayor of Perpignan, traveled as far as the Polish border and brought back to France refugees, women, children, senior citizens, brought them back home to Perpignan to keep them safe. Poland now has three million Ukrainian refugees on its soil. I sounded the alert many times. But we need to be careful. Delivering weapons to Ukraine could turn France into a co-belligerent. That is the concern. I agreed with all of the sanctions uh, taken against uh, uh, Russian oligarchs and banks, but the only sanction that I disagree with is uh, is the ban on imports of Russian oil and gas, because I don't think that is the right method. I don't think that is what will hurt Russia. But I do believe it will hurt the French people very much. And I do believe that blocking such imports will have unintended consequences. And I hear that uh, negotiations will begin after France loses the uh, presidency of the EU. But the consequences will be cataclysmic, not just on private citizens, but also businesses. So I believe that we cannot fall on our swords simply hoping that this will hurt Russia financially. Russia can just sell its oil and gas to other countries. So that was the only caveat that I expressed. But I do have one fear, a long-standing fear, a long-standing fear of our country, but also of other major powers across the world. I am concerned that this will throw Russia into the arms of China, that they will become such close allies in the future, that they will turn into a superpower, both economically, monetarily, maybe even militarily. This could be a huge risk for the West, for Europe, and for France. Those are my caveats. These are the concerns that I expressed. I sounded the alert on both these issues because, once again, I believe that we live in a complex world, and under the circumstances, we need to look to the future, both in the medium and long term, so that we don't solve problems today with uh, in ways that will hurt our future. Title 42. Um, the day the war stops, will you lift sanctions against Russia? And we French will be able to consider Vladimir Putin as a fully fledged partner like any other. 
First of all, let me um, take note of what Madame Le Pen uh, has said, uh, which is in fact not what uh, your party and your MPs are saying in the European Parliament. Uh, protecting, uh, when we're talking about protecting the Ukrainians uh, here uh, in our country or protection and assistance to Ukraine, financial uh, uh, help, that you opposed it. Just look at the, the, the votes, the count. Uh, incidentally, what you've just said is exactly the opposite of what historically you have always said. I believe you were one of the first European um, political leaders in 2014 to recognize the result of uh, the referendum in Crimea. Uh, I think um, since World War II, basically, we've no longer uh, gone along with um, uh, forced uh, um, annexation in Europe, especially when uh, Vladimir Putin himself had uh, said that everything was going to his tune. Uh, why am I saying this? Because you are, in fact, in uh, Russia's grip. In 2015, you, madam, uh, had took out a loan with the first Czech uh, Russian bank, which is close to the authorities, and you reworked it. Uh, I mean, all of this is uh, fact and well known. Uh, working with a number of people who were directly related and involved in the war in um, uh, Syria. So you're not talking about other leaders, but just about your banker when you mentioned Russia. So obviously, when uh, there are brave decisions to make, neither you nor your representatives are uh, in attendance. And it's hardly surprising that five years ago, Russia uh, in, interfered in the campaign to um, destabilize me, and it's hardly surprising that you were a bit um, unsure what to say, because you're just not going to be able to operate uh, to defend French interests because of how they're tied with yours. Marine Le Pen, you can respond to what Emmanuel Macron said. You depend on the Russian power of Vladimir Putin. Emmanuel Macron has access to all of the information provided by French intelligence services, and you know fully well that this is wrong. You know fully well that I am a completely free woman. I am a patriot. I have been a patriot my whole life, and I defend France and the French people, no matter the circumstances. I tracked down a tweet dating back to November 9, 2014. I support a free Ukraine, says the tweet, that that is subject to the influence of neither the U.S. nor the EU nor Russia. That was my position. It was the same for Iraq in, 20, in 2003 and the same for Ukraine now. But are Ukraine without Crimea, madam? We'll get to that. Crimea did not pose that many problems, and I remember that you hosted with much fanfare Mr. Putin in Versailles. I, I hosted a head of state, not my banker. In 2017, you hosted Mr. Putin at Brigançon, your summer vacation, and on that occasion, you said the exact same thing that I'm saying today. On that occasion, you said that Russia should shore itself up to the EU once again. You said that Europe should spread all the way from Lisbon to Vladivostok. But I'm still not saying anything else. What I'm saying is that that posture is not dignified. But am I saying something that's wrong? Is it wrong? And let, let me speak to the substance of what you said. I'm, I'm not coming back uh, on anything or reneging on anything. I'm, I'm recognizing that Europe has its full, that Russia has its uh, full place in the European security architecture. But what have I said? Is it wrong? Yes, Mr. Macron. It is both wrong and rather dishonest to tell you the truth. Let me explain why. Good. Tell us. Why was I forced to take out a loan? So you took one out country? then. And that's something that everybody knows, is because no French bank agreed to give me a loan. And at the time, you found it so outrageous that you enacted a piece of legislation on the Bank of Democracy, which you never actually implemented. Why didn't you, Mr. Macron? Why didn't see that effort through? 
that Bank of Democracy initiative, you knew that this would fill a democratic gap, whereby banks get to decide which political party to support and which not to. Mr. Macron, let me tell you something. Look, 2015 was when you took that loan out. You still haven't paid it back. So it's not about the Democracy Bank or anything other. Um, candidates in this election, such as Monsieur Zemmour, didn't go out and take a loan out in Hungary or elsewhere. They found a bank that would loan them the money in France. So, okay, it's not the same then. It takes a while to pay back a loan. And let me tell you, I come under the scrutiny of the Campaign Oversight Office, and they are extremely stringent in their controls. And there's something else I want to say to you, Mr. Macron. There are millions of French people who, over the past five years, have gone to the bank to get loans, uh, to buy a car or to mortgage their house. They don't owe you a thing. All they want to do is repay their loans, just like me. And me. But as you said, they go and take out a loan in a French bank. They don't go out abroad to get a Russian bank related to the authorities uh, for millions and then not pay it back. Mr. Macron, I simply cannot let you say that. Look, you said it yourself. We repay our loan every single month under the supervision of the campaign oversight but body. But look, you still haven't paid it back. It is true that uh, we are a political party with not a whole lot of resources, but there's honor in that. I'm not putting, calling your honor into question. There's nothing wrong with that. But I, there is a dependency link that there is there. The only dependence that I feel is the fact that I have to repay my loan, Mr. Macron. But it wasn't a bank, uh, any old bank in Russia. It was a, a bank close to the authorities. They just admit to it. Mr. Uh, Macron. Look, so many of your choices can be explained by this link, by this relationship. I'm not holding this up against you. I'm just saying that other candidates with similar ideas to yours have not made the same choices, that they have found funding in French or European banks, that you made a choice, a choice that you were bound by uh, in your and that you imposed the constraints on your political choices. That is simply not true. I said it before, I will say it again, this is simply not true. Look, you're just saying wrong, wrong, but we're listening and to I you. And I believe the French people know it. I, I too have loans, uh, like um, all of our fellow citizens, to buy a house or buy a car, I mean, to use your examples, but we have not gone and taken a loan out uh, in Russian banks. It's rather dishonest, Mr. Macron, to stop me from... Look, I know you're unhappy with it, but it's a fact to stop me from getting a loan from a French bank and then blaming me for going abroad to get one there. Honestly, did I stop you from getting a loan in a French bank in 2015? Weren't you the Minister for the Economy back in the day? Uh, well, I wasn't Minister of Finance. I, I didn't have the banks. You know, no one did anything there. One crucially important question. I'm sure there are issues that are much more important than this. Look, it's always important to speak about the standpoint. There's Europe. The European Union, very little time left on international relations before moving to pensions. The EU, simple questions put to both of you. Would you like to remain in the European Union as it is today with the Franco-German tandem as an engine, Mr. Macron, you're slightly behind over to you. Look, I've always been very clear here, and I think our discussion, our debate five years ago had mainly focused on that specific issue. Five years ago, 80% of your uh, platform was only uh, applicable if we withdrew from the euro. There was this whole thing about euro and the EQ. No one really knew what it was. Uh, clearly, your campaign platform hasn't changed. You still want to withdraw from the euro, but you've not really said it. I, on, for my part, believe in the euro uh, in the franco-german tandem that was key to achieving something when we got the pandemic we uh, in france didn't have um, mrna vaccines but we were pleased to have them uh, we manufactured them eventually and exported some for our own benefit and that was mainly due to this franco-german in agreement to start with we also uh, on that basis uh, pooled our future debt we started establishing the groundwork for a European defence. And I must say that I am convinced that our 
Uh, sovereignty is both national and European that both work together and with Europe we will be more independent in terms of energy, technology, defence, uh, agri-food and when we speak about Europe that also means speaking about farming. Uh, our farmers know how important that is, they, they know how important the CAP is for them to take farming forward uh, in these times of changes. So we do need a stronger Europe, a more integrated Europe and we need a Franco-German tandem to drive it, uh, which is what we used to do with uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel and what we're doing with Chancellor Scholz. Same question, Marine Le Pen. In your platform, you see the advent of European nations that would gradually replace the EU. Does that mean you want to exit the EU or the European as it exists today suits you with the Franco-German tandem as a driver? Let me start by telling Mr. Macron, that there is no European sovereignty because there is no such thing as European people. France is a sovereign country because France has a people. You actually did this symbolically. You replaced the French flag by the EU flag under the Arc de Triomphe. Uh, the EU is not a question of all or nothing. It's not a question of taking everything and, and shutting our mouths or taking nothing pure. I wish to remain uh, a part of the European Union, but I do wish to overhaul it radically. Why? Well, because there are a number of EU policies with which I disagree. For example, I disagree with uh, the raft of uh, free trade uh, agreements where we uh, sell German cars uh, while sacrificing farmers. Uh, where there is unfair competition from uh, Canada or Brazil, whether they sell us beef or chicken. Well, what Canadian chickens? I disagree with the directive on posted workers. Tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of uh, posted workers come to our country, work there, but they're not paying taxes or payroll taxes to France, but to their country of origin. I disagree with a uh, policy that you supported that reduces uh, EU farming output by 10 percent at a time when there's a global food crisis, which will probably cause hunger strikes in a number of countries across the world. So there's a raft of EU policies that I disagree with. So how come France can never defend its own interest? I served as an MEP. I saw German stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with us in other countries, defending their own people and their own interests. France never does that. How come? Maybe, maybe you just didn't go to Parliament often enough. How come France doesn't defend its farmers, its industry, its businesses? That is what I wish to do. So once again, I want the European Commission to show respect for sovereign nations, the member states, because we make social and societal choices. When we vote, we, the people of France, make choices as to the kind of society we want to live in. And I do believe that the EU should respect that. So yes, I want to overhaul the European Union from the inside. Mr. Macron, I didn't think that you would believe in uh, conspiracy theories. Uh, interesting thought from you. If I wish to exit the EU, I would, pro I would say it. I don't. So 80% of your platform has changed. Uh, good thing. 80% uh, of your uh, platform five years ago was only applicable without a euro. But can I come back to what you just said? Look, changing the club uh, by yourself, uh, uh, reducing your, um, your dues, um, well, either everyone will chip in and follow, or you'll just go solo. It looks like you're suggesting going solo. Also, according to your uh, program, you still want this alliance with Russia. Interesting. Uh, you mentioned uh, Brazilian chickens. Uh, can I just say that uh, France did oppose and clash with Mercosur, quite simply because um, I asked for a mirror clause. When we ask something of our farmers, we want the same thing to be done by their own farmers, which is why we uh, stalled the negotiation because there was no commitment to the Paris commitments to biodiversity, and we fight. Uh, we've managed to fight against uh, imported um, deforestation. Um, we also uh, 
And I agree with what you said about dropping uh, production levels. Uh, wrong now. Uh, you, we are not um, being negative on, C on the CAP. Now, on posted workers, look, there aren't hundred thousands of them. There's maybe 5,000 jobs, uh, 50,000 posted workers. But for uh, the last five years, I've been working fighting to change Europe. Uh, things didn't happen overnight. Look at vaccines, about mutual uh, or pooled uh, debt. These are things that have changed, and I've worked hard day after day after day on this. On posted workers, we changed the rules so that uh, you would get equal pay for equal jobs, precisely to fight against these difficulties. Now, when I look at your program, at your, uh, your manifesto, uh, posted workers, you seem to just want to do away with it. Well, you'll just have to explain your hundred uh, thousands of uh, French who work abroad what it's all about. Uh, so this isn't going to work. Now, if you look at the values of Europe and the rules of the European Council, uh, the Council of Europe, uh, the energy market, Schengen, all of this is a bit fuzzy. Uh, when you look at all this, uh, clearly, uh, even though it's not saying it, you you want to pull out of Europe. It is the Europe of nations. Yes, but if it's not the European Union, you you just need to pull out of the EU. I mean, you can paint it over the way you will, uh, but uh, look, it's like a shared property. You can't just change it and say that you're changing the label or the name on the win on the letterbox because you're Mrs. Le Pen. I think I have higher ambitions than you do. Look, I have ambitions too, and I'm taking everything working, and I'm not being misleading on what I'm saying. Everybody knows I stand for the Europe of Nations. Everybody knows what I don't want, and everybody knows what I will change, and I will make those changes together with allies. You said that you have secured major advances when it comes to posted workers. That is simply not true. You made sure that fraud could no longer happen, equal work and, and equal pay. And that wasn't but, the case before. But the payroll taxes continue to go to the country of origin, even though the work is being done in France. I do believe it is a net loss of revenue for our country. Yes, it could, is. Could You're please right. Finish? Please let me finish. And I do believe that uh, workers, foreign workers, get the preferential treatment on the jobs market. Say company hires posted workers is going to cost them less. And this means that other companies are forced to use posted workers as well, so as to align themselves and remain competitive. I do not want that preference for foreign workers. My priority, my obsession is for French people to be able to work in their own country. And that is why I am fighting. I believe in work in that value, finding work, keeping your work, working in your own country. Can I, can I just add? Time is not on our side. Just, just adding to move to the next that's what Madame Le Pen is saying is true, but uh, national preference per employment, that means the end of the European single market. Look, if a Bulgarian worker comes to uh, France, you can't just say, I won't have it in or have him unless they pay all their taxes in France or become French. And we want our workers, our French people, to go on working in Belgium or Germany or elsewhere. There are lots of them today. I mean, it's always the same thing. You always think that you can have national preference for us and no one else will impose it too. But a European market is all about freedom of movement of uh, goods and workers. If I may, Mr. Macron, I'm sure we will discuss uh, national preference when we deal with institutions. Uh, you are extremely European-centric. No, I'm not. This is how I see France. We are a world power, not just a European power. We haven't talked about Africa. Of course, we need to develop new relationships with African countries. We haven't discussed our overseas territories, which serve as platforms. Yeah, but, but that's not abroad. Please don't interrupt. French overseas territories serve as platforms for France's influence uh, on countries all around them. We haven't talked about any of that because your vision of things stunts France. In your mind, France has become a continental country. No, we're a global power and we need to renew 
our ambitions of global influence, working together with special partners, particularly French-speaking countries in Africa, who are long-standing partners of France, and we need to restore our relationships with them. Man, look, Madame Le Pen, how fascinating this is to look at your cynical, cynical approach. You're talking about a national preference against Europe, as you just have, trying to explain to us that uh, we're done with uh, the European market, and same goes with uh, the goods, because you'll have as many uh, border f w police officers as in 1980, and then you're telling me that I'm all shrunken and shriveled and looking at uh, my own self, but you seem to be doing that. Look, the other day you had a uh, uh, international Affairs uh, um, press conference, and you didn't mention Africa. I have been to Africa more than any of my predecessors. I value this relationship. I re-established it, relaunched it by being honest uh, and brave about our story, our history. I don't think that's the case for you, but uh, I think they're, they're stunned by what they hear you when they look at you. I mean, you want to ban uh, the headscarf in the streets and things like that. Look, I mean, when you say you want to uh, have to be a global uh, power, you need to be realistic. But what you're putting forward is something that is uh, shriveled and falling back on itself and goes against uh, unifal French universality. Your words are extremely confusing. No, I'm not. Look, it's all factual. You'll have every opportunity to talk at length of these topics, but we have to move to the next topic. It's all fascinating. French people see clearly your differences on international relations in Europe, but we have to move to a topic that was hotly debated in this uh, campaign. We see your disagreement. To what age will we have to work if you're elected? Let's be honest. Both of you have changed tack, and the French people sometimes have difficulty. What you're proposing precisely, Marine Le Pen, as President 27, at the end of your five-year term, at what age will the French people retire? They will retire. They will retire between 60 and 62 years on a full pension, and they will need between 40 and 42 years of service to get a full pension. That is a choice that I made very clearly, because from a philosophical point of view, I do believe that uh, the welfare system uh, serves as uh, is equal to the wealth of those who have no wealth, and I firmly believe in that. When you heard the welfare system, you heard the institutions of the Fifth Republic and the welfare system. Well, the cornerstone of that welfare system is retirement, is pensions. So the harder you work and the earlier you start working, the earlier you should retire. So I propose a progressive system. If you get your first job between the age of 17 and 20, you get to retire at 60 assuming you have 40 years of service under your belt. And gradually, the later you get into the jobs market, you have to accumulate those 40 years of service, but retire later, the later you start working. I know that Mr. Macron's friends have tried to create uncertainty and therefore anxiety among the French. All of the uh, schemes for early retirement in case of long uh, careers, all of that will take priority over my reform. If you have an existing system and the benefits that you're getting are more advantageous <coughs> Your system will prevail over my reform, but retirement at 65 is completely unfair, and that kind of injustice is unacceptable. To simply contemplate that French people will go into retirement at an age where they're no longer capable of enjoying their retirement when most of them aren't working anymore because at age 62.8, 62 years and eight months of age, half of them are still working. At that time, nobody gets a full pension because nobody gets to that age with a sufficient number of years of service because that requirement will increase as well. By definition, if you push back the illegal retirement age, this will increase the number of years of service. I don't really know what you and your friends agree with between Mr. Damana and Mr. Attal is 40, 42, 44 years of service, what you're saying is simply not justified from a budget point of view. 
Same question, Emmanuel Macron. If you're re-elected president, can you clearly state to the French people this evening at what age they'll be able to retire at the end of a possible second term in 2027? Yes, look, um, there's still much progress to fund. Uh, and we've done some uh, over the last five years working on health and other things. And we also have to look at um, the elderly and care for the elderly. We'll come back to that later. Uh, and we want also to improve uh, the size of pensions. They, uh, I think we n need to have, for instance, for a basic minimum of 1,100 euros if uh, you have the smallest pension. <coughs> I think in your system, uh, you're offering a thousand euro for someone who's never worked and someone who has always worked. So I think we need to have a difference. The minimum, the basic uh, minimum for uh, work is 980 euros nowadays. And I think we need to push it up to 1,100 euro. And even before we do that, uh, there's an imbalance, financial imbalance in the pension system up until 2030, according to the um, uh, advisory board on uh, pensions. And it's only normal given the crisis. Now, I agree with what you said uh, initially that uh, our system is key, that uh, those in work are paying for the pensions of those who are retired. Um, this is our pay as you go system. But I think we need to improve uh, the pensions of those who have a full uh, career to 1,100. Now, I don't want to increase taxes. I've reduced taxes by 50 billion over the last five years. There's no um, property. You know, some of the rates have been cancelled. Uh, and I don't want to increase taxes. I don't want to increase our debt. I want to start paying it down over the next five years. So the only way we can do that is to work a little longer. One of the... Um, things, of course, is full employment. And um, that's what we've tried to focus on over the last five years. And also, we need to push back by four months the uh, age of retirement every year, so uh, 65 in 2031. Only four months extra every year. Yeah. Now, agreed, for lengthy careers, we have to protect the system that you mentioned. But there's also the issue of hard work. Um, now, it's likely that us four here will go on working after or beyond the age of 65, going by what's happening in our business. But those who have had uh, to work in difficult uh, works with hardship careers, but you will need 40 years of service. Uh, no, I mean, uh, I don't think that you're being fairer anyway, because you're not taking hardship criteria into account. Uh, someone who would start uh, a hard career or a, a difficult career at the age of 65 would work all the way through to 65, according to you. So I think two things we have to take in goal. First, lengthy careers. Secondly, the hardship factor. Uh, for instance, those working in the slaughterhouses, uh, uh, long-distance uh, drivers, uh, night uh, shift, etc. So people who would be joining these uh, 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 can no longer uh, can benefit from this. But others, uh, other jobs in other previously favoured regimes, such as in the electricity board or the uh, public transport, cannot benefit from this. I mean. Uh, you need to be honest. I mean, of course, to, to get elected, it's easier to say, as you're saying, that we can cancel a system uh, or a reform introduced in the past. But because the imbalance, you're either going to have to have extra taxes or threaten pensions. Mr. Macron, I'd like to remind you that as president, you created 100 billion euros no, of madam. additional debt in five years. No. That had nothing to do with COVID. And two-thirds of that debt has nothing to do with it. And these are the figures from your own ministry. What? No. So maybe only 500 no. billion for COVID, and the rest is just the debt getting worse. No, it's the social security system and the local authorities. Mr. Macron, don't lecture me on how I'm going to be funding my, I'm my own not. platform. 
You have to be humble. I mean, you racked up debt to the tune of 600 billion euros. She's two minutes late. Look, with this extra 600 billion in debt, yes, that's true. But we draw we draw down the drew down the deficit in the first few years of my uh, term of office. 600 uh, billion. That's 200 billion actually for the central government, and the rest is social security systems and local authorities. People weren't working, so we didn't take uh, cash in the uh, payroll taxes. Uh, we didn't call in these taxes. Uh, whatever it takes is what we, what was our guiding principle. What would you have done with that? You're three minutes behind Marine Le Pen. Thank you. This is an opportunity for me to get back to, I will answer every single one of your questions, particularly all of the wrong things that you've been saying, but I'm having a hard time keeping up with you. There's just so much. Earlier, you said you reduced unemployment. Unemployment as announced by the International Labor Office. Now, you know that there are many restrictions, so much so that the unemployment figures, in other words, A, B, C, uh, job seekers came to 5.5 million when you uh, were elected, and then 105 million. Look, no one's ever counted and tallied Bs and Cs. Now, obviously, it's a question of communicating vas vessels. Uh, Job seekers are switched from category B to C to A, etc. But people who actively sought work, well, they came to 5.5 million then and 5.4 million now. So I have my doubts as to your success in reducing unemployment. You've been explaining that you've worked really hard to uh, make things better for the lowest income households. But under your watch, 500,000 poor people are now on the radar. That is your track record, sir. You exp you're telling us that you're very good at economics and businesses love you. So be it. The uh, foreign trade deficit is huge. And you can't fake those figures. It's an absolute record, in actual fact. And the most brutal figure, the cruelest figure when it comes to you, is productivity. As it happens, productivity has plummeted, Mr. Macron, the second you got elected. And productivity gain is 0.1% versus 1.8% for other OECD countries. So some people called you the Mozart to finance. Maybe this is, I'm not saying you introduced yourself as such, but people saw you that way. But your economic track record is terrible. I'm not forgetting the, is it 17,000 or 15,000, pardon me, 14,500 uh, industry jobs lost under your watch. And uh, in in terms of job destruction, your track record is even worse. So I believe there is another way. We need to change our priorities. We need to change our methods. We need to change the way that we look at the economy. We need economic patriotism. We need to relocate activities back to France. We need to reindustrialize our country. We need to help the very small companies and SMEs as well by reducing their taxes. And I'm not talking about giving tax breaks to major corporates the way that you did, because when you reduce taxes, you always worry about the big fish, not the little fish. And the biggest tax break has been the uh, removal of the wealth tax. No, the, the, uh, the rates, the tax on the housing tax, madam. No, the French are paying for their housing tax via the property tax. No, look at the numbers, look at the numbers. We hear you talking about the funding of your respective programs. A few seconds. Look, uh, you'll see that Madame Le Pen hasn't said anything about COVID and the 600 billion debt related to COVID. That's something I'm, I'll agree to recognize, recognize acknowledge. Uh, we know that there was a difficult situation with the financial crisis. Uh, there, was un there was unemployment. You don't even mention unemployment in your manifesto. Now, 
<clears throat> you saying well, that we're helping the big companies. But what about uh, the restaurants, the small business people, uh, the uh, laborers? You let them come and tell us who helped them during the COVID crisis. What with furlough, with uh, guaranteed uh, loans, with uh, us covering um, their own payroll taxes. We did it, and I'm proud of that. This is 600 billion in debt that we run ourselves all together. And this is a pandemic that was unprecedented and had been for the last 100 years. And uh, we managed to drop, uh, get unemployment to drop to, from 9% down to 6 and a bit. Um, maybe you don't like what the ILO is saying, but category Bs and category Cs are not counted. We not, they're not counted in uh, the unemployment fingers. Well, they'll be happy to hear it. Uh, look, I mean, we're not even talking about these. We're talking about real people, people uh, and the lives of our uh, shopkeepers, about uh, the restaurants. I mean, you voted against uh, this. Uh, um, Madame Le Pen MP voted against. Would you have done something different? Do tell us what you would have done. I'll tell you. That's going to be difficult in just a few seconds. The first lockdown. I proposed equity. I proposed equity for all small businesses uh, and SMEs, uh, 1,500 euros per company and 1,000 per worker. So the uh, state guaranteed loans uh, that you granted to companies, and now they have to pay them back. So you push the problem back in time. Yeah, but we always push it back. It's almost quasi-equity. And so this means that companies can no longer invest. And after the first lockdown, you continue with the curfews, you continue to shut down businesses and uh, draw in the difference between essential businesses and non-essential businesses. I disagree with that for a very simple reason. At the time, after the first lockdown, we knew. We knew that in actual fact, small businesses were not where the virus was being transmitted. And so you organize administrative shutdowns. And now you're explaining to us that storekeepers should be grateful to you for compensating their losses, the losses that you trigger, that you are responsible for by organizing these administrative shutdowns? Look, I, I won't uh, be uh, so bad that I will come back and revisit COVID. Uh, what about the Russian vaccines and the Sputnik that you were pushing? No, Mr. Miserly votes for you now. Yeah, but I mean, I'm talking with you. So all your friends, just look at how they managed the COVID uh, crisis. Uh, a cause for me to rejoice. Can we move to the hospital? There are many topics that you'd like to address, and we'll be pressed for time. Long-term care, hospital, major subjects, COVID, public health systems is on the verge of collapse, as medical staff saying. If you're re-elected, Emmanuel Macron, what do you say to the uh, nursing health care staff? It'll be a lot better with me over five years. First of all, we have a crisis both in hospitals, but also because we have these so-called medical deserts, both uh, in uh, some parts of towns and in the very rural areas. In 2018, I uh, introduced the end of the uh, so-called uh, flat rate in taxes, also the, uh, put an end to the numerous clauses. It's come, kicking in far too slowly, but then we had the crisis, and I'm very grateful to our doctors and all the healthcare workers. And during the crisis, we decided uh, to invest 19 um, billion euros in, into our hospitals, and also in, decided to invest in wages. We uh, introduced uh, hikes, wage hikes uh, by 180 euros uh, a month, and up to 400 euros at the end of a career. So. We haven't quite finished, and I know how much we owe to these people. I know how uh, difficult it is because there's a shortfall in doctors, in a shortfall in uh, in nurses, in uh, nursing assistants. Uh, but I do know that what is difficult nowadays are actually the working conditions. So we need to go on investing in the environment to um, restore hospitals, to hire again. The only way to do that is to improve the working environment and therefore to invest. There are a number of measures, and we can come back to that later, uh, 
a number of measures we can introduce to put an end to these uh, medical uh, deserts where there are no uh, doctors. And what we want to do is have uh, hospitals, uh, uh, practice doctors, uh, and uh, other healthcare workers, uh, pharmacists, uh, physiotherapists, etc., working together to structure healthcare at a local level and also um, make sure that you have pe someone you can turn to when you have a, a healthcare issue, uh, which is why I'm happy to invest such significantly. Faced with the collapse of um, the public health care system, if you're elected president in 2027, will hospitals be a lot better? Yes, it will. It will be a lot better. Now, there's something that I find uh, striking. Uh, throughout your term, Mr. Macron, uh, you kept waiting for crises. It takes a crisis for you to get your, for you to get moving. It took a crisis for you to realize that the healthcare workers had been suffering for years. You didn't show that much empathy for them when you made redundant uh, 15,000 healthcare workers uh, without pay overnight because they refused to uh, get tested before going to work. They refused to get vaccinated. You, you caused them to lose their jobs, and I don't think that was right and I will give them back the wages that they lost because of you. So it took a crisis for you to start moving. Now, we were aware of the hospital system collapsing. You had been uh, you had been at the helm for two, three years already. You could have taken action. You failed to. Yes, uh, nursing staff are understaffed. Medical, des medical deserts uh, have been around for a long time. It's very hard to find physicians. 2018. 2018, madam. In any case, yes. In any case, I do believe we need to invest 20 billion over five years, and this means 10 billion for increasing pay for personnel and also hiring new people, particularly in nursing homes, so we can avoid the tragedies that have come to light and also avoid the suffering of both healthcare workers and patients because all of the nurses that I've met with, and I've met with dozens of them across the board uh, in mainland France and also in overseas territories, they complain that they don't have enough time to spend with each patient. They don't have enough resources. And they were blaming themselves. They said, we have so little time available that this boils down to abuse, the way that we treat our patients, but we can't do better. We have no time. So they need to get paid better, and we will use state coffers for that, and we will invest $10 billion into hospital equipment, uh, uh, MRI machines, and other types of equipment, and the sovereign fund will be instrumental in that. This will be a private fund, not a public fund. I hope I do believe we need to further develop uh, telemedicine. We need the tax incentives for physicians to encourage them to go and uh, set up shop in medical deserts. We need to rebalance uh, our public policy between mainland France and our cities and rural areas. Financial incentives are well and good, but the physician is not going to move to a medical desert if the wife can't find a job, if there's no school for the children. Unfortunately, the deserts will get worse unless we take action. And this is so unfair and seen as deeply unfair by most of our people. Both of you have used the word dependency. Long-term care really... Um, Hurt the French people after the publication of book to see how our elders are treated in nursing homes. Simple question for both of you. How can we stop this happening again? We need oversight. These are places where people are vulnerable, and those places need oversight. That I believe that's one thing we absolutely must do. Also, we need a minimum, minimum staffing levels. And we need to be very stringent and demanding about it. Based on how many residents there are in a nursing home, we need sufficient staff. We need a coordinating physician. There are still 30% of nursing homes that don't have a coordinating physician. There should be a nurse present on site 24-7. There's still a significant share of nursing homes that do not have a nurse on call 24-7. And also, we need a pooling system. We need to think about a pooling system for nursing homes. There are nursing homes that make money off the backs 
of their residents. And it's simply outrageous. This is a model that find that the French find shocking. Making money off the backs of vulnerable seniors is unacceptable. And the French people refuse that, as we can easily understand. So we need a pooling system between private sector nursing homes and public sector nursing homes. We need a pooling system, a mutual insurance system, so that families can be involved in management of those what are structures. you proposing to avoid this happening again in the nursing homes? Can I just add sp something specific? Uh, the numerous clauses uh, uh, reform was introduced in 2018 before the crisis of COVID. And the Segur conferences was in 2020. So I just wanted to mention that to be uh, clear. And again, the pandemic was uh, had been um, unexpected and unheard of for, for the last 100 years. So anyway, on old age care, first of all, most of our uh, fellow citizens who are growing old want to grow old at home. And we need to be able to help them, first of all, by helping them um, equip their homes. Uh, we want, uh, therefore, to introduce a bonus payment to, to help people uh, adjust or add a few steps and make uh, the toilets or the bathroom more accessible. Secondly, we also need to be able to help those um, carers, many of them women, who uh, are uh, working under the basic uh, um, the minimum wage because they are not playing the full um, working week. So what we need to do is to give them these extra hours so they can get a full wage. Uh, so what I want to uh, introduce is to give them more working hours so that they can look after more effectively and care for these elderly. Um, I too heard what you mentioned. Many of the carers and the healthcare workers feel guilty because they're telling us that they're not working as uh, doing their job as they would want to, that they're um, abusing these people. I mean, the fact is, for instance, that uh, washing and cleaning uh, a patient can't be done in half an hour in the morning. Then controls, checks. Uh, we have to have that. Um, and uh, I do agree that older people's homes have to be um, promoted and uh, regulated, controlled. There are some uh, mutual organizations, and these are good, uh, but we have nothing against uh, for-profit organizations. But we need to be able to create more jobs, which is why I'm suggesting uh, 50,000 extra nursing and nursing assisting, uh, assistant jobs, quite simply because the, um, it, the, the patients in these institutions are uh, getting older, they need more support, they need better care, and we need to be transparent on how we're going to fund this, which is why I'm asking people to work that little bit longer, and I'm quite open about it. <coughs> I don't think it's possible to fund absolutely everything. Uh, financing it on with uh, full employment. And again, uh, it's incremental increase, not 65 years. But well, things are confusing on your end. There's a table. It's very specific. Everybody can find out. Again, four months them. extra every year. Can we remind well, isn't that you wonderful, that full the employment? Yes, well, you know. <laughs> Five years, madam. With Lea, with the time keepers, we now like to turn to a crucially important topic. It's an anxiety for young people. You'll be able to return to funding amply, a source of anxiety for the young, the future of the planet. The IPPC, the Climate Change Panel, said we only have three years left to limit uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Marine Le Pen, if you're elected president, what were the two measures you'll take in that? Firstly, no more hypocrisy. It's hypocritical when you refuse to see that uh, free trade based economic models are responsible for much of greenhouse gas emissions. 50% actually in France. So we cannot seriously claim that we will tackle the problem while at the same time refusing to admit that 
imports account for 50 percent of greenhouse gas emissions. This is why I I believe it makes no sense to import products that are manufactured 10,000 kilometers away. This model is killing the planet, and which is why I do believe in local sourcing. I do believe in relocating activities and production. I think we should be able to produce the products and services that we use, produce them locally as close to, as close to consumers as possible. And we need to relocate. But this is a responsibility that the government should bear. And for that, we need economic patriotism. For example, we need to stop importing 50% of our fruit and veg when we are fully capable of producing them here and meet domestic demand. So via economic patriotism, we will make sure that uh, local and regional authorities, the government, and uh, the catering industry will undertake to buy organic foods. Well, French organic food, not foreign organic food, because their standards are not as good as ours. We need French sourced organic food in cafeterias all across the country. It is absolutely key. When it comes to the environment, there's something that we don't often talk about, animal welfare. Why? Because free trade, the free trade model has hurt animals very much. And when you're okay with supply lines in which animals are born in France and you transport them in trucks in terrible traveling conditions, hundreds of kilometers away, so they'll be fattened up somewhere else, and then they have to travel thousands of miles again so they can be slaughtered in a different place. This system makes no sense. It creates unemployment. It generates greenhouse gas emissions, 50 percent, like I said. And also, this generates, this hurts animal welfare. This is bad for industry because of unfair competition from abroad. Very often, the products that we import do not meet the standards that we have selected as a society. And this means unfair competition with French producers. So. Before we talk about energy, which is absolutely key, obviously, we need to challenge our current economic system. And then there are energy choices that we need to make. The same question for Emmanuel Macron. What are the two pledges that you commit to to fight against climate change? Well, very interesting to listen to you, and it just shows how inconsistent our, our whole discussion is. When you speak about uh, calling into question uh, free trade and our imports. Look, the imports that are uh, more of a problem, including in terms of commercial uh, balance, is precisely, or balance of trade, is precisely um, uh, oil and gas. And you were suggesting the largest possible subsidy to these because you were bringing down the VAT. So I'm just saying that your manifesto and your program just makes no sense. You were talking about a lasting VAT drop on uh, oil and gas, which is, anyway, uh, I think we have therefore a clear, a clear controversy here. You are climate skeptic. That's pretty obvious. You said yourself that uh, carbon neutrality at 2050, so basically uh, the Paris Agreement just can't happen. And I must say, I read and was struck once again by the IPCC um, report. I, I've done a number of things, but I think we want to go even faster. We've uh, increased twofold the reduction in. Uh, is something that creates suffering. It doesn't work. And it's always the same people who are hurt, who are being fleeced. And it is the people who don't have the resources to resolve those issues. So I completely disagree with that. Yes, of course, we need an ecological transition obviously, but it needs to be staggered over time. It needs to be much slower than the pace that we are forcing upon the people of France. Secondly, you change gears. With regard to energy, for example, energy provides structure to the future of a country. Uh, it's important to be self-reliant. 
uh, in terms of energy and also uh, decarbonization is key. You've changed tack completely. Uh, initially, you wanted to close down Fessenheim without any uh, safety related justification. Everybody said that there was no problem in terms of safety, but yet you wanted to close Fessenheim. You contemplated uh, uh, shutting down uh, 14 nuclear reactors. And at the end of your term, you said, I got it wrong. You may have gotten wrong, but you got it wrong while you worked under François Hollande, which means that you have destabilized the nuclear uh, industry, which needed to be supported, uh, strengthened, which needed visibility when it comes to the future, because nuclear energy is good for decarbonization. It helps the country be self-reliant, and we need nuclear energy as a core aspect of our energy mix. So you decided to go for wind and solar wind farms. There's nothing worse. Ecologically, it's absurd. Economically, as well. It's a nuisance. It's bad for biodiversity. It's a choice that reduces a property prices all around the wind turbine. And obviously, intermittency is a problem. When there's no wind, the wind turbine doesn't operate, does not generate power, which means that you have to offset that with coal-driven or, uh, or gas-driven power plants. You have uh, power. Your three-minute lead, Emmanuel Macron, Marlene Le Pen mentioned at the end of the day you agree with the policy on nuclear power. Big difference, however, regarding wind power in her program. Marine Le Pen wants to dismantle them, not build any new ones. You're in favor of wind farms, especially offshore wind farms, right? Look, I mean, there's nothing on uh, the environment in this. There is a paper a specific paper on the environment. Yes, quite impressive indeed, uh, which actually mentions what I uh, just said. Anyway, uh, I served as Minister of Economy and Finance. I um, did, uh, and I must say so, I can't let you say what you just said, uh, worked on the restructuring of the nuclear sector. Uh, we worked uh, and saved with the uh, EDF, the French electricity company, uh, saved the industry and restructured it. Fessenheim, look, uh, there was, there'd been no investment since 2012. It was the oldest uh, plant still up and running, and there'd been no investment since 2012. So, yes. And when you look at the problems we have with the current plans, uh, plants, uh, what with the investments that I uh, launched at the beginning of my uh, term of office, clearly it didn't make sense to keep Fessenheim up and running but compensation for the uh, territories and the people. <clears throat> uh, we have almost caught up on the uh, delay in the, uh, in the Flamanville uh, power plant, um, and we had to explain how people might change uh, places to go on working uh, in electricity, and we managed to do so. So I, I did have a genuine strategy and have had over the last five years. And since 2018, I revisited the issue of uh, nuclear energy um, and the reduction that had been planned earlier. And I asked the uh, International Energy Agency and, and uh, RTE to uh, give me a report. And they tell me, they show me, that your policies are unpracticable, uh, quite simply because uh, they can be no um, withdrawal from fossil fuel uh, without going to nuclear energy. Now, nuclear power plants that we would be deciding upon now will only come into operation in 2035. So uh, you can't just um, move from one to the other. You have to uh, do both at the same time. I'm sorry to have to say it again, and that's what the report said, which is why uh, I suggested and decided upon new tranches of the EPR uh, power plant, six and then eight, uh, to have an increase uh, there to drop 
um, uh, a little bit on uh, wind farms, uh, but uh, to switch to solar energy, I mean, uh, um, small scale um, um, sun farms is what people want. Why quite simply? Because they those create uh, jobs. Now, wind farms, you're saying that you should, we shouldn't just stop their operation, but actually decommission them and um, dismantle them. And that um, costs a tremendous amount of money. And I think that public uh, money should be spent, could be spent more effectively. When you have offshore wind farms, you actually create jobs. I was in Le Havre last week, and uh, here in France, we're producing uh, the wings and the entire uh, infrastructure for these offshore wind, wind turbines. Now, admittedly, you have to discuss with the fishermen, with um, uh, the um, uh, with everyone, with the stakeholders, but we have to make sure that we don't make the mistakes of the past once again. We have to d develop and deploy uh, industries here, which is what I started doing over the last five years, from uh, electricity uh, and from batteries so to you wind won't farms. agree on this. You're running a bit late, but briefly, France. When I hear about uh, consulting with fishermen, I've met with them, and obviously this is sort of an outcry among them because the whole fishery sector is, is going to be ruined. I think you want wind turbines uh, all along the shoreline, except for maybe uh, off the or coast of Le Touquet, I mean, because there are limits, process. right? No, no, that please. is a reality. I'm sorry to say that. Please, come on. Every wind turbine has been approved except Planning hasn't even started. off the coast Look. of Le Touquet. Dismantling wind turbines, that is approved when they are installed vis-à-vis -vis I mean, the Caisse de Depot. And I always said I would initiate that dismantling effort and 2,000 wind turbines are coming to the end of their uh, service life. Dismantling is not paid for by the government. So you won't be dismantling them then? It's the operator that does the dismantling. And again, this is approved by the Caisse de Depot. There is something that I want, however. Wind turbine that cause major nuisance to their neighborhood and this is happening more and more, we will start dismantling those first, and then we will hold a referendum. We'll ask people how they feel about it. I know you don't like that, but I do. I like to ask people how they feel. Um, no, having local referenda is fine. So Allah will ask the French whether or not they wish to dismantle wind turbines. Again, this is very costly for the population. This ruins our landscapes. Uh, the power is intermittent. We have to use gas and coal to make up the shortfall. We need to focus on nuclear as the core aspect of our energy mix. And hydrogen is also something that I believe in. But how are you going to manufacture green hydrogen? We will use nuclear to produce green hydrogen. Yeah, so you're going to reduce uh, renewables uh, capacity. So you do that with nuclear energy for tomorrow because it's not geared up to uh, manufacture hydrogen as it is today. It's there to keep us warm. So with your strategy, you won't be able to. But don't you have a plan to develop nuclear? But look, you won't manage at that in that timeline. You have industry. I will develop a plan the second my term begins. I'm not like you. I would not have shut down Fessenheim. No, thank you Bear for reminding everyone. You this definitely could mean are not problems the same as me. in terms of power generation down the line. I will initiate the project while the power plant in Flamanville is ready to operate. And then we will start dismantling the turbines so, because this is something that the French want. Look, hydrogen is not a source of energy. I understand that, but we're talking about the energy mix. Yeah, but no, look, uh, green or low pollution hydrogen. And for that, you need nuclear. Yes, you need a nuclear or renewables. Now, if you're putting an end to renewables, we'll have less electro electricity to go on. De facto, uh, even though we have uh, the uh, 
needs and the demand we have today. You're not going. You're not explaining how we're、uh, not going to rely on Russian gas, for instance, because you're reducing the capacity, the production capacity. I just said that I would do this gradually, based on our capabilities. Look, your new、uh, ec- nuclear will not come into、uh, force before 2035. I mean, in Belfort,、uh, EDF is telling us it will come what, in in 2035. What about Flamoville? Will, will it open in 2023? Look, we've got this already on board. Look, your strategy doesn't doesn't fit. Yes, my strategy does close the loop. Please, look, congratulations,、um, shared time. Look at the clock. Your. Perfectly level pegging. Let's move on. Great many issues to address this evening: law and order, immigration, how we govern the country, how you want to change things. But there's an issue:、um, appeal to foreign direct investment, the digital economy, Amazon, Apple, Google, or American firms, TikTok's Chinese. How can we have a French Google? A、uh, French Steve Jobs, Marine Le Pen. The first thing we could have done, as you well know, the EU meddles with absolutely everything, particularly what's none of its business. So sometimes EU directive actually hurt our vital interest, our security, and our economic interests. In this case, it's been years now. It's been years that、uh, the EU should have、uh, launched its own version of Google. It's been years now that we should have started thinking about how we can ensure data conservation on EU soil. I know that it doesn't come cheap. I know that、uh, the Americans are way ahead of us, which is too bad, really, because our engineers are great, and we used to have the lead in all those areas. My proposals. I do believe that at the EU level, we need to behave the same way that we did for airspace. We created Airbus. We created Ariane rockets. So we need to do the same thing for data conservation. But no attempts have been made. Rather, attempts have been made, but they haven't been successful. Why are they American? Chinese and why Steve Jobs was he an American, not a Frenchman? Well, first and foremost, I would like to support our workers because we have great strength and we have created so many startup companies. In fact, we are the European leader in terms of startups. We have a number of unicorns. Unicorns are those companies that、uh, go above a certain level, and we have started with a few, and now we're at twenty-five of them. And we've got、uh, Blablacar, Dr. Lib. So these are fantastic companies of which we can be very proud of. And、uh, Dr. Lib was a great champion throughout Europe, especially in Germany, throughout the crisis. And the difference between us, China, and the United States is that there's a difference in vision. And the thing is that France is not Europe. The United States is a market with some 400 million people. China, f- over a billion. France is just under 100 million. So, if we want to have a market of equal size, then we need to be acting at the European level. We need to break down barriers. So, anyone who is against Europe is against developing such giant companies in Europe, because ultimately, it needs to be Europe leading the way. Remember, Google. Google wasn't created by a country; it was created by entrepreneurs, and we need to create the right situation for those entrepreneurs to grow and flourish. That's the first point. Second is we need to protect our citizens, and Europe has laid down the first international standards for that, for private data, the GDPR. It is the general ruling on private data protection. That was Europe that put that in place. So Europe protects us, protects our citizens, and it's thanks to that that we now have a cloud that will be there soon, where we will be able to put our data and store our data and protect it. So I believe. That we will be able to build France driven by digital innovation, and for that we need to train. And that's why in France we need to have a strong government-backed policy for research and training. And this is something that we are going to invest in. I want to put that in for the next ten years. That's in France, but also within Europe we need to have European-wide research programs. We need to have a European market. 
so that we can act as fast and as powerful as our Chinese and American counterparts. But then we also need regulation. And that's why we need European level regulation put in place against unfair practices. So when we have these major companies that aren't paying taxes, well, who is going to be there on our side to protect us? Europe is. And that's what we've seen over those past four years. We saw that there were blockages in place when it came to regulation, and we saw that Europe was the one who helped us push through. 15 seconds, 13 seconds for Marine Le Pen. When I hear you talk about Europe, I think of General de Gaulle. Marine Le Pen, please don't talk about General de Gaulle. I don't have a problem referencing General de Gaulle. The EU did not originate Ariane, did not originate Airbus. No, you're right. It's actually the Franco-German partnership and friendship that is behind that. But you want to break that partnership down. Not at all. Not at all. It is. You do want to break it down. Please let her speak. It's not easy if he won't let me speak. Yes, on this particular topic, yes, of course. It is at the European level that things should be done. But at the European level, not at the EU level. Let's not confuse the two. I don't have a problem with Europe. I love European countries. But the EU is a political structure. One that we created. Secondly, we were talking about innovation and businesses. But what about the rest? Well, that's exactly the question. Please answer it. I hear you. The problem today with our economies, and I guess according to the CR, this also has to do with how we can fund our retirement systems, is the lack of productivity. Why is that? Because we operate in an economy that is becoming poorer and poorer, which is becoming uberized. We are creating jobs, yes, but the, there's no job security. These are low-cost jobs. I'm talking about the gig economy. I'm talking about a delivery, delivery, food delivery services and whatnot. And I do believe that is uberization is a major mistake. You can't create value or wealth or fund anything with that system, not welfare not the necessary development. So I think that uh, we need to focus our efforts on industry. That is key. And I believe that that effort has not been made. If you will, I try to put myself in the shoes of people. Briefly. You talked about Europe having its own Google, but the your French viewers who are watching right now, they may live in rural areas where there's no FTTH, there's no fiber optics, there's no digital coverage. So maybe that should be one of our top priorities because we will need digital coverage throughout the country for telemedicine, for being able to talk to a doctor online, all these things, all these new technologies, they won't work if there's no online or digital coverage. You were talking about inventions. A moment ago, the recent inventions, the economy of productivity. Let's talk about the intelligence of tomorrow, your children, training education of the of young people. All international rankings show that the level of knowledge of French students, you know, the PISA ranking showing that the ranking of our French students in IT is down. It was ranked 12th a year ago. They're down to 20. Sixth position, if you're re-elected, Emmanuel Macron, uh, what will you do to halt that drop? It's a shame that we couldn't continue talking about agriculture, which is such a fundamental industry within our nation, because within my five-year term, for the first time in 15 years, we've been able to create more jobs than we actually broke. We opened more factories than we closed down, contrary to what Mrs. Le Pen is trying to say. And these are, this is all of the reform I tried to bring, but you opposed it. But you lost 14,500 industry jobs during your term. Those figures are wrong, and the INSEE can show it. I tried to make things easier for people in our nation. But you do opposed it. 
I found it outrageous. I found it outrageous the brutality with which you forced us through. I will hold a major social conference in the fall with trade unions so finally we can talk to each other because a bit like every other intermediate body, they feel completely, they feel your contempt. Mrs. Le Pen, if you had wanted to support these industries, well, it's because we spoke with our social partners. The labor executive orders is not something that went down well with them, particularly your reform of unemployment insurance. Again, the lowest income households were hurt. All were of that reform goes to create an attractive, appealing it's workforce. Always, it's always the poorest that suffer the most, and this is how you improve the attractiveness but, of our country. But when you create a million jobs, it's, be, it's showing that we are tackling poverty in our, in our country. You, can, you can't he, he talk about industrial relations and because for years they've been saying they don't want to talk or they don't want to work with you. The CGT, all of them, none of them want to work with you. And that's why I sat down and spoke with each and every one of them during the COVID crisis. Well, they're not going to be very happy if you call them. But you stood up against it. You wanted to bring up... Uh, you, you wanted to put in a system that wouldn't have worked, but I brought in a short-time short work system that worked fantastically. If we were teachers, uh, we'd say, let's focus on the issues at hand. Back to the school, it's crucially important Sorry, I just want to, fix some wrongs there. to halt the drop in um, schooling levels of our students in France. Well, in fact, we've already started to do it. We invested in the most in the younger generations at school, in the early years of primary school. And because of efforts that we put in in those early stages, for the children of our nation, those who are struggling the most, we've put in systems to help them catch up. So what I want to do now is continue to invest in school by ensuring that people study mathematics right up until the end of high school. We want to have a half-hour sports class every day because sport within school is a fundamental part of learning. We want to also expand the education of arts and culture because I think it is a, another fundamental part of schooling. We also need to ensure that the junior high, they also get additional funding so that we can invest right where we have to. But then after that, we want to ensure that everyone starting again in junior high have proper career path management so that they can be proud of what they want to work in. It's about giving them exposure to businesses outside of the schooling world so that they can learn about the world, so that they can know exactly where they want to go with their careers, which would be one way of righting the wrongs that, unfortunately, our younger generations are facing right now. One third of our high school students are currently in vocational training. And I think it's fantastic to see that because that leads into apprenticeships. There were fewer than 300,000 apprentices every year before I, before I came to term. And now we've increased it to 710,000. And also we can work on universities by ensuring that they give, lead into jobs. We will continue with free university education. We will also ensure that we can continue to bring in the reduction of retirement contributions for students. Sorry, I'd just like to continue speaking. We have large objectives that will and targets that we set at the national level. But then, locally, at local government levels, we will ensure that it can be broken down and applied and adapted to that local context. So all teaching staff in schools will have a pay increase because it's thanks to them that we're able to open our schools during the crisis. And we will ensure that our teaching staff have innovative tools at their disposal to ensure they can provide innovative education. You've anticipated on questions. First question, Marine Le Pen, how can we return being the top of the rankings to stop the dropout rate of our pupils and will you increase the pay of teachers? The first thing I'd like to say is that uh, young people in France have suffered so much. 
Over the past two years, for the past two and a half years, they haven't been able to socialize. Uh, but very often, they were away from their families. Uh, they uh, couldn't uh, do the usual odd uh, jobs, which meant that they ran out of money. Uh, the mental health problems have been severe because of the lockdown, because of the health crisis. So to me, it made total sense to make sure young people are a priority of my term if the French elect me president. And this is why I focus a lot of my measures and a lot of my uh, priorities around young people. For example, uh, develop uh, vocational high schools and uh, channels of education, uh, promote apprenticeship, work-study contracts. You've done that, Mr. Macron, but these are transitional measures. My measures will be sustainable, but you've done something good. The reform on education will be long term. Oh, is it? I also want to increase the wages of these work-study uh, beneficiaries and apprentices by 230 euros a month, depending on their age. Secondly, working students need assistance. They need additional income because those students who actually work at the same time, they're pretty brave. It's not easy to combine the two. They should receive 20% of their wages uh, up to 200 euros, and 300 for uh, bursary beneficiaries. And they need to be able to travel. They need to be able to find jobs. And so uh, during off-peak hours, they should be able to travel for free. Young people aged 18 to 25, that is. And the problem is the value of their degrees, of their diplomas has gone down. Generally speaking, the value of degrees and diplomas has gone down because the value and what the baccalaureate, the high school uh, graduation exam, what it stands for has gone down. I mean, what value has it if everybody graduates? 95 percent, 98, 99 percent of a particular age group? So I believe we need to focus on the different uh, disciplines, the different fields whether literature, philosophy, but also primary skills, because they're so important. And there's one thing that Mr. Macron hasn't talked about, the need to respect your teachers, the need to make sure people are safe at school. The reform that you're proposing is about paying um, paying teachers no, based no, on their results. That. Was that a suggestion from McKinsey? No. I wouldn't be surprised, and I do believe that would be completely unfair. As you well know, depending on where teachers work, the academic level of their students differs. I gave a 4,000 euro bonus to, to this, and I've already been increasing pay for everyone else. That's all well and good, but teachers are very unhappy. You basically want to pay them based on the academic level of attainment of their students. I want them to get paid more, 3% more per year. What, you're going to give them more by making them work more? They will get paid more for that extra half day in primary school. So you haven't put that in the budget either? Brilliant. Yes, I have. I have budgeted that. And if you will, this will mean that pupils get to sixth grade, and when they get to sixth grade, they are proficient in the French language, which is not the case today. 20% of sixth grade children don't have the fundamentals. But what I wanted to talk about is safety in schools, safety and security in schools, that are entire classrooms that are together with a teacher that are bullied by a handful of individuals. Rubble rousers, bullies who hurt the entire classroom, who damage the future of the rest of the class, who can't get to work, do their homework, because you need a peaceful environment in order for teachers to pass on their knowledge to the pupils. And you need to show respect for teachers. And we need to stop sweeping those problems under the rug. A lot of teachers feel that they can't voice their concerns because they're not supposed to make waves. And disciplinary bodies in the school system are afraid to impose sanctions and 
and expel those delinquents who's, who are misbehaving. They're free to misbehave as long as that they don't hurt the futures of their classmates. I do believe that schools are the crucible of our republic. It is so important, and this is something that we need to save, because it's fast disappearing. Emmanuel Macron, your response. <coughs> School. We're just talking about increasing pay for teachers. Let's start with that. Well, we started it in my term and will continue through, continue it through to my next term should the people vote me in for a second term. And also we will ensure that there will be an initial pay grade of just under 2,000 euros. That was one of your promises back in 2017, but it didn't happen. But the 3% you're, you're offering, that won't let us get there either. And I'm going to give them pay increase without asking them to work Yes, more. it would work, because it would mean uh, almost 16% extra at the end of the year. It's 3%? 3% uh, per year. Wait, so are you going to re-employ all these people who have been laid off? Or are you going to, how are you going to do it? Because I think we should really talk about how people are going to fund all of these well, electoral campaign promises. Well, considering your billion euros of debt, I mean, you're perfectly positioned to talk about refinancing, right? Look, again, you're coming back with this talk about COVID, but the money that we put in for COVID was for COVID, and there are other budgetary things that we're going to be bringing in place in the future. Again. I know what it was like for a lot of people over the last over the last few years. I know how challenging it was for so many children who weren't able to go to school. I know how difficult it was for so many families and young children. And I know that if we didn't open schools when we did, then we would not have been able to help these children. There are children who would not have been able to eat their one daily meal. Because this was a pandemic that we had, of the likes we had never seen before. And because of the policy that we put in place, because of the investments that we put in place, we were able to continue to train up our younger generations, the children of the French Republic. And we were able to avoid the catastrophes that we saw elsewhere around the world in the United States, where they, where they closed down schools for some 30 weeks. So that's why I strongly believed in keeping our schools open, in having these French schools, the schools of the French Republic, having them open. So yes, you're talking about increasing pays, but I also want that, and there is no, it's not pegged to anything. We're not expecting anything from teachers, anything more. So we want to have heads of schools, we want teachers, we want all those people providing extra cur curricular activities to be able to benefit from this. For those parents who didn't have access to books at home, well, that's what they can get now with these schools. So schools need to be able to work with everyone and they need the funding for that. The problem, Mr. Macron, is that uh, in terms of your vision, it, uh, it seems as though everything, all of the effort go, all of the effort goes into large cities. You forget about the countryside, you forget about the rural areas, you forget about the disenfranchised neighborhoods. We're talking about a poor neighborhoods, impoverished neighborhoods. I believe that we should expand this uh, uh, effort to the rest of France, to the entire country, so we can turn things around in terms of primary school. Primary schools don't work, not anymore. And this is why our standing is dropping in all international rankings. You, you, you remove mathematics and then you no. brought it back. No, no. You keep on doing what you've done. Come on, please. And the other way around. You can't talking. Uh, what you're suggesting, it's impossible. It's impossible. Here we're talking about the most impoverished neighborhoods in France that we're trying to support. Just look out in the rural communities. You, when you were talking about having uh, trains coming back to these uh, to these communities. 
about bringing fiber optic connection that is into these communities. That's what we're doing. I'm just talking about the reality, the no, real that, lives of these people. That has nothing to do with fear. They're feeling completely abandoned. No, we're talking about the number of children per class because that's in these rural communities, that's where they are the but most there's a reason vulnerable. For that. So why close down schools if the mayors don't agree with That is simply not true. You no. well know and that uh, the mayors the schools continue to, to shut down. To down Classrooms continue to shut down. There are millions of people watching, and they know that there's a school each, or there's a classroom that shut down in their own village. The mayor had to be consulted. It was approved, and it's been it's been like that ever since the beginning of 2019. And it's because I believe so strongly in in French schooling because I grew up in a household of teachers. Um, at the same time on the clock. We're on time. You're on time too. Congratulations. Let's move to the next topic, one of the priorities of French people. Um, you broached recently the question of um, law and order in front. You guarantee before the French people that with you, at the head of France, there'll be less violence in the streets, uh, in families, violence against women, fewer burglaries, uh, homicides. Can you guarantee that? Yes, of course I can. Otherwise, I would have run for president. I believe that, in addition to purchasing power, security is a key and legitimate request of the French people. Our country is in dire straits, and I'm mincing my words. I'm, I'm being careful in terms of the terminology that I use. We are faced with barbaric behavior. We are, things are getting wilder and wilder everywhere I travel. Even deep into the countryside, I have people telling me that we can't do this anymore. There's insecurity everywhere. Whether you live in rural areas or in the city, or whether you're using mass transit uh, systems, insecurity is everywhere, and this requires a firm response. And this is happening across the board, all over France. Are people stealing gas, siphoning off the gas in your tank. People stealing sheep, standing sheep, live animals, or stealing the harvest from the farm, stealing fertilizers, anything available, anything that has value, somebody will steal it. People are afraid. People are afraid to be stolen from, to be assaulted physically, and that is unacceptable. So there are two things that we absolutely must do. Number one. Unbridled, mass-scale immigration is a problem that we need to resolve, and I'm stating this very clearly. That worsens insecurity in our country, and this is why I want to suggest the referendum to the people of France. I'm sure that later we'll have an opportunity to discuss this. Uh, the goal being to radically change our immigration policy. The French should get to decide who comes to France, who stays, who leaves. We need to uphold the law and deport illegal aliens as well as felons and criminals. Secondly, we need to be firm. Of course, prevention is important, but we also need to be firm and tough on crime. In the area of justice, the French feel that because of a lack of resources, very often, there's no security. People are allowed to do whatever they want, so we need more visible policing. Law enforcement has suffered quite a bit from the contempt shown to them by your government, the doubts that you expressed regarding them. So they need to be equipped, rearmed morally and physically. They need you to show them some love. And we need to remind the people of France that it is thanks to law enforcement that we are able to live in safety and security. Also, when sentences are handed down, we need to make sure that they're actually served. Adjustments to sentences because of Mr. Bira, because of Mr. Dupont-Moretti. 
avez des peines à ménager. There should be. Les aménagements de peine, j'ai été avocat, c'est considéré par les dénateurs. We need to be careful when it comes to uh, adjustments to sentences. When the sentence is adjustment, when the sentence is adjusted, it feels as though we're doing nothing. House arrest, that doesn't work. C'est mieux de mettre une petite peine. It's better to uh, give a small sentence that is actually served than a longer sentence that nobody serves. They're doing it in other countries and it works beautifully. I think that we absolutely need to tackle the problem. Physical attacks on individuals are unacceptable. It's simply not okay to be attacked physically for no good reason. That simply is unacceptable. And this is why I cannot state this cl more clearly. I want an end to those sentence adjustments to all firm six month sentences. I have a lot more to say on this topic, obviously. But none of this is possible unless, of course, we build more prisons. I understand that uh, a lot of uh, judges are now going to hand uh, down a sentence if they know that it's not going to be served because there's no space in prison. So we need more openings in the prison system. 25,000. Marine Le Pen, five minutes lead. Same question for Emmanuel Macron. In 27, will you pledge if you're re-elected? Less violence, um, less uh, crime in this country. Well, I mean, it's a hard question to answer no to, the way you've worded it. Sorry. The unwritten question, what are the resources you're going to deploy to achieve that? I'll talk about that. So, yes, we will make sure that we have the right means and resources. Now, I just recall what happened five years ago when we were debating before the first round when a police officer was shot down. Now, now, we know that we have to obviously continue to support them. We, we're not just there in hard times. We're there all by their side all the time. You know, it's not you what you would have tried to do. That, Mr. Macron. No, I made promises and I've upheld my promises. 10,000 police officers and gendarmes, in addition to the ones we already have. And we don't do it just by tightening the belt, we do it by putting in the necessary means. And in, in addition to that, we also increased funding for the justice system, 30% increase over the past few years. So you said that we're going to employ more judges? Well, we're doing that. So we are putting means in place so that we can reduce petty crime, and we have reduced petty crime. The figures are there, statistics there to show us that all of the work that our police officers are doing on the ground is already bearing fruit. All of the work that we're doing to counter terrorism. There were 30 odd terrorist attacks that were foiled because of all of our fantastic work. Now, that is a topic that you clearly wanted to avoid, but it is something that we have made considerable progress on. If I could just focus on a few key points so that we could really show exactly everything that we have done over these past few years. The murder of women, predominantly something that occurs within the family, or within homes. But we have worked to tackle that. One person is attacked every 44 seconds. I mean, seriously, when the victims hear you say that, that we'll talk about murdering women later. No, I'm talking about women who are being murdered, victims. But that's not what we're talking about. 80% of such violence occurs within the family sphere. And all of these lives, these are lives of people, and every life counts. 
Your track record speaks for itself. What I'm trying to say is that we've been training police officers to identify these sorts of crimes so that they don't just try and sweep it under the rug. Because what used to happen in the past no longer happens now. People used to just go into the police station and they would make a a stat declaration, and then that would be it. And then there wouldn't be any investigation afterwards. But now, that changes. And we're uh, changing with our police officers, with the justice system. But we are using ways to keep violent people away from their family. We have put in place measures to do that. And with all of the reform that we've put in place, that took a, a lot of work, and we have put that in place. And with all of the budgets that we have set up, and we already have the upcoming budget, we'll be able to create 200 additional gendarme brigades for the rural areas of France. So these brigades, they will be there to ensure stability across the nation by tackling drugs, everything that we've been ramping up since uh, 2018, but also for general misdemeanors. But there's another issue, another form of security, cyber security, cyber attacks against hospitals, public services, terrorists, terrorists, all forms of criminals are going to use the cyber world for their criminal activity. So therefore, we're going to create a system with 1,500 cyber police officers to tackle this sort of cyber crime. But then the next point, justice. Obviously, the justice system will only work if the sentences are effective. But what's the point of putting someone in prison if they're just going to be hanging around with other prisoners who have committed more serious crimes? So therefore, we need to ensure that we have a system where minors will be put through the justice system, either by putting them into a military institution where they can serve in the military, or by doing community service. But when we look at this notion of putting them into prison just for two, three, five days, as you would suggest, we've seen the figures and it doesn't work. But we are going to continue with the reform of the justice sector that I've already kicked off. Because it is important that we support our magistrates, our judges, bailiffs, all the ministry staff within our courts. We need to be able to employ more of them so that we can reduce the burden that they are facing. And it is disgraceful when we see that there is this sense of impunity. And that sense of impunity comes when the justice system isn't efficient and fast acting. So that's why we need to invest more so that the justice system can work faster and more effectively. So you've set out your plans. You've, you both had five minutes to set out Five minutes that. each to discuss over. insecurity. Five minutes is a bit short. We have a question on secularism. Press for time. Mrs. Levin, you seem uh, much better behaved than last time. We're getting older and wiser. <laughs> well, you well behaved for the time being. Yes. Let's question on the secular society. It's an important question, important point of your manifesto, yours, Marine Le Pen. Question to both of you. Ditto, simple question. If you're elected or re-elected, will you change the rules that govern the wearing of religious signs in public area. Will a woman be able to wear a headscarf in the street or in the metro? Will it be banned? Allow me to take a step back. This is a topic. This is a topic that uh, the media have discussed passionately in recent days, but it's part of a whole. Uh, I haven't forgotten about terrorism. I haven't forgotten about Islamism. I believe that terrorist risks are still extremely high. There has been a raft of terror attacks. Sorry to say this. But a raft of terror attacks that were perpetrated by individuals. 
So I believe that Islamism is present in our country. And your policy against Islamism, against terrorism, has not been effective. I think we need to fight Islamist ideology. I've said this before, I will say it again. I'm not fighting a religion. I'm not fighting Islam, which is a religion which should be allowed. What I fight is Islamist ideology, which attacks the very foundations of our republic, attacks secular government, de democracy, gender equality, an ideology that tries to impose Sharia law. I believe that this brand of Islamism should be fought by a republic that is proud of itself. We have nothing to be ashamed of. And by way of example, there are 4,500 foreigners who are on file. They are in the database that uh, contains all the names of radicalized individuals that have disturbed the peace. These people should be deported. The government deports uh, illegal aliens who are also in the database, but not the foreigners. I do believe that they need to be deported because we need to protect our people. There are 570 radical mo mosques which need to be shut down. A secular government charter is not enough. Yes, it has been implemented, but those who refuse to sign it are free to go about their business, are free to continue to preach and recruit and expand their influence and continue looking for funds. I believe that we are not tough enough on this. The current government does not fully appreciate the severity of Islamism. You haven't answered my question on religious signs. You're going to change the law. I believe in banning hijab in public areas. I cannot state this any clearer. I do believe that headscarves, hijab, is a uniform that is imposed on women by Islamists. And a lot of young women who wear it have no other way. They may not dare say it, but they are forced to wear it because they're isolated, because otherwise they would be insulted, attacked, harassed, because they are being sidelined and accused of being impure. I believe that is the term. Such a situation is unacceptable in our country. We need to free those women. We need to push back against Islamism. And I do believe we need to ban hijab in, air, in public areas. Emmanuel Macron, what would you do if you're re-elected? Headscarf in public areas. Do you keep the status quo or do you change the law? Well, I've um, just been listening to you. But what I find concerning with your train of thought is where it leads. So you started with the veil, spoke of terrorism, then of Islamism, and then spoke of foreigners. And you go from one point to the next, you use your train of thought, which doesn't really hold up. Here we're talking about wearing a religious sign, a religious symbol, such as the head veil. Now, if we go back to 1905, we go back to the fact that the French society is a secular society. So therefore, with me as president, we won't ban the head veil, the kippah, we won't ban any form of religious sign in the public space. Because if you go down your avenue, then you will ban all forms of religious signs. You have not read my proposal then. No, whatever you say, you must come back to the French constitution. Because even if you are elected, which I, I don't wish to see, you will still have to abide by the constitution. And according to the constitution, we have to abide by secular society. It is a form of liberty and freedom. So, within schools, there is no veil. It's because we are, we are, we are shaping minds. And in those spaces, in schools, yes, the veil is banned because we are trying to create minds, shape minds for the future. But in the open streets, if you put it, if you apply this ban in the suburbs, then you are just going to create civil war. What, what you're saying is very serious. Are you saying that the people would not be okay with complying with the law? No, no. We need to be very serious about this because he, you're trying what you are saying. Already you're saying that there's a number of people who would refuse to respect the law? But what I'm trying to say is that France, the nation of the Enlightenment, 
is a country in which we have a band, the first country in the world, the first country in the world, where we would put a ban on such religious signs. That's the France you want to have. We will have been the first country in the world to have implemented many different legislations, Mr. Macron. It's about legislation to provide freedoms. You are creating a form of this law which will just protect freedom. others. But did you, what did you say about headscarves a couple of years ago? Have you changed your mind again? No, I, I haven't changed. Change tag. The France that you want to create is not one of universal ideals. Imagine your France. You would have police officers running down the streets chasing down girls wearing hijabs or, or boys wearing the kippah. That's the France that you want to have. As many as law enforcement officers who, who hassle people about wearing and not wearing masks. No. You're not taking this seriously. Clearly we disagree. Yes, we do disagree. Because I think... The France that you want to propose is one that goes against the On very the contrary, ideals. I do believe that this legislation uphold. would defend the, the French Republic. Now, we mustn't mix up Islam and Islamism. There are many French citizens who are Muslims. But this and, is something that I said before. And they live peacefully in our country. Here, we have Muslims who died in terrorist attracts. And, and she continues to wear her headscarf. But you want to take her headscarf off? Oh, come on. No, in concrete terms, in tangible terms, that is what your policy would do. We have people, French citizens, who would not be able to go into the public arena, into the streets, because of the law you want to bring in. So we have a law in France that we voted, you didn't vote on it, a law that reiterates the principles of the French Republic. Absolutely nothing, sir. Absolutely nothing. It does. It did actually serve something because we were able to shut down a number of not-for-profit organizations which went to get the principles of the French Republic. We were able to close down those schools who were trying to spread Sharia law on French soil. We were able to close them down. There were other organizations, far-right organizations, who also went against the French principles. Now, you've come up with these figures about for of the 2600 places of religion there are 98 percent of those sites a percentage of them were suspected for being extremist and 23 of them were closed down all of the others are still being assessed. Now, before we brought in this law, we couldn't have done that. Even if you had an imam saying the worst atrocities about France, we wouldn't have been able to investigate it, but now we can investigate that. We can close them down. So this law has been able to put an end to foreign powers enacting their influence on French soil. We put an end to that system. So we have made progress. And we continue to fight against radical Islamism. But that's exactly what my platform seeks to do. No, the difference is we don't confuse the two, we don't mix up Islam and Islamism. That's exactly what my proposed legislation will do. And again, many thanks for this opportunity to remind the Muslims that I'm not waging a war against their religion. In a number of cases, as it happens, uh, Muslims are the prime victims of Islamists. The people who live in those neighborhoods which are being held by Islamists and thugs are the prime victims of such crimes. And I believe we need to uh, defend a secular government and gender equality. We need to fight Islamism using legislation that targets only them. At least things will be clear. But the figures that are provided, fortunately, are real. They are true. They come from the authorities. 570 radical Muslims, that's what the figures say. Your legislation was useless. You set up a secular government charter. So I just told you exactly what we're doing, and the mayors are doing fantastic work with the secular charter. But what happened? 
What happened to those who signed that well, charter? We've been, we've been subsidizing it. I would like to see evidence of that, because I did check, and nothing, absolutely nothing has happened. It's not true, and you know They're still it. there, and they shouldn't be here anymore. If they're foreigners, if they're aliens, they should go home. They should be deported. Not signing the charter, being a foreigner on our soil and refusing to sign that charter, you should go home. But obviously, deporting people is 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 not something you believe in. You have deported absolutely nobody in the course of your term. But we're talking about French organizations, French not-for-profits. On the immigration front, I believe you have the worst track record with the past 15 years. Years. Please, we're talking about religion. Here we're talking about religion. Ideology, but what we're talking about also is ideologies that. Are but yes, it is an ideology, religion. not a religion. That's where you got it wrong. No, you can't. You, you can't say that a ban on the veils in the street is a ban on radical Islamism. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Believe it or not, but in a lot of Muslim countries where Islamists or secured their grip on government, they forced women to veil themselves and wear headscarves. And there are Muslim countries who. And Muslim countries who regain power against the Islamists, the second they died, the second they, they, they were in office, they stopped that and stopped forcing women to wear headscarves. No, please. Slips of the it's tongue happen. It's all wrong. The bans you're talking about, it was bans in schools, not in the streets. But, but the discourse was much firmer than yours on this topic. But everything we have done is bearing fruits, but you can't create division in France by sending people, by kicking people out of the country like you would have. Okay, there is a topic which is important to immigration. We haven't talked about it. And that's well, you were talking about bad. immigration? I'm not talking about immigration. You're, you want to send away French citizens. This is what I want. To make it possible for the French people to vote on immigration via a referendum, so we can change the current rules. I would hold this referendum if I'm elected. I would probably hold it in the fall. And we would look at uh, a number of changes to the Constitution. The Constitution is the highest law of the land, and therefore only the people has the right to modify the Constitution. And in that referendum, which is a bill in itself, and I'm calling upon the entire population to check out my website and read that text, because it would include uh, deporting uh, foreign criminals and felons, uh, removing birthright citizenship. French citizenship should be earned. You shouldn't get it automatically. And also maintaining national preference for French people when it comes to uh, housing, allowances, housing, low-income housing. In particular, businesses should give French uh, workers or French recruits priority when they're trying to recruit people. Sorting out administratively um, illegal aliens should be banned. The first thing we need to do is is force them to go home, and there they get to ask permission to come back. They can go to any French consulate in any country and apply there. Because we have a problem at the moment. We have a lot of people who come into France, they ask for asylum, they are denied, and yet they stay here. Deportation orders are implemented only in 10% of cases. And immigration is a problem that is forcing a society to spend a lot of money and a lot of effort in many different areas. You have a few minutes to set out your proposals on immigration and respond to Marine Le Pen. I would just like to say that on one side, we have asylum that we have to continue to provide. These are people who are fleeing their country because there's war, because they fight for freedom. That's asylum. And we need to be perfectly clear with French citizens. We have taken in a lot of Ukrainian people. They're war refugees. 
Yes, we have taken them in. So, whatever changes you want to bring in, if you want to change our, if change our values, whatever you want to do, we've still, we will still you can't blame me for that. do it. I'm just showing there are differences here. But there's also economic migration. This is what we need. We have students, men, women, who come to study and work in our country and make our country stronger. And that is regulated with residency permits. And we will continue down that vein. And then there is also undocumented migration. And the issue here is that the various avenues that people use through these systems to come to France tend to use the asylum networks. So at Tourcoing, a few months ago, I brought in a proposal to reform the Schengen zone. Because oftentimes, People come to Europe and come to France via other countries, Spain, Italy, and the likes. And we have the mafia, mafia and smugglers who use and who, who use these networks and who prey upon the weak and the poor. So we need to protect these people. Another reform is that we have. We are reforming to reduce the time it takes to process applications. Now, COVID, uh, unfortunately, impeded upon our work as part of that reform, but we are continuing, continuing to reduce that time. And everything needs to take place just six months, in just six months, and it's very hard. The third main well, part the best is way that we need to not let them come in in the first place. We need to have a better policy when it comes to returning people to their home country. And for that, we need to look at our visa policies, and we've been looking at that with a number of countries, because there were a number of people on the on that file that you were talking about earlier. But as part of that, we have to work with the home countries because even if you have a referendum, you're not going to be able to take, you're not going to be able to send people back home to their country because you're not president of that country. Earlier, you mentioned the word referendum that you wanted to organize. Brings us to a final topic, very important, that of the institutions and governance. France, it's not new, but the situation's got worse. It's a real crisis of confidence, mistrust in respect of politics, institutions. Both of you these past 10 days have mentioned words such as seven-year term referendum, proportional. Emmanuel Macron, if you're re-elected, will you frequently use a referendum? Will you establish proportional representation under a seven-year term? First and foremost, so we've just been through quite an interesting five-year term because we went through deep crisis, the pandemic, first and foremost. So, well, some people have said that I didn't bring in a referendum this year. Well, and some of my predecessors didn't uh, bring in referendums, referenda in their first terms either. Nevertheless, I think it is a fundamental mechanism within our constitution. And if we were to change the way Europe is organized, well, as Europe was reorganized, after the war, then we saw how important the referendum was at that time, and I will continue to defend that. And when you are elected by the people, that just doesn't give you the right to change the constitution without respecting and abiding by that constitution, because that is the very framework within the election is organized. And the proposals that Mrs. Le Pen would like to bring in are anti-constitutional. That's a problem in its own right. So yes. I wasn't able to bring in constitutional reform as I wanted to during my five-year term. So we have political forces, political groups that will be that will be elected in the coming weeks as part of the legislative elections. However, there are political bodies that won't be properly represented because we don't have the system in place for that. And that's why I would like to see some form of proportional vote in the future. So that's why we're going to sit down with the electoral commissions to try to figure this out, to try and find a way to improve 
our political institutions. But also, people want something that is practical. And, and I tried different avenues. I tried a town halls. I tried a generalized debate. I tried all forms of participation. And what I see is that French citizens, they want to be actors of change. They, oftentimes, you know, we think it's a top-down measure, but they have far better common sense than we do for a number on a number of topics, and that's why it's important that we look at how power is practiced within our nation. So we're going to bring in reform and we're going to set the overall strategic guidelines at the, at the national level, but then it will be at the local level where they will be able to implement, implement those decisions under the guidance of the local prefects. Minutes lead, Marine Le Pen, same question. How do you combat this democratic crisis? Proportional representation, the representation. A transpartisan committee? Are you trying to reinvent the National Assembly? But you just want to change everything without changing the Constitution and not by abiding the Constitution. A place where parties talk to each other? It's called the National Assembly. You put that aside for five years. Anyways. Yeah, there was consultation and votes every time. What I want is for democracy to be reborn. We need a democratic renaissance. We want the National Assembly to have more powers. But we also need to actually implement meant the Citizens' Initiative Referendum, or RIC. I want 500,000 French people to either be able to submit to the French people for approval either the possibility of abrogating a law or submitting to them a bill. This is a message from the Yellow Vest crisis. What they wanted was more democracy, but they weren't heard regarding proportional voting. You didn't want to implement it. I still, not, I still don't understand why, because at the end of the day, the National Assembly has the final word when it comes to proportional voting. So you could have pushed that through. You chose not to. I believe that the main problem is after your five-year term is the lack of unity. You have divided the country. People feel your contempt. They feel that you're not hearing them. You're not listening to them. You do not consult with them. And when they do say something, you push them away with your harsh words. Your words have been brutal. Let's put it this way. You have divided this country. We need to rebuild France and bring people together. I believe in a democratic renaissance via a citizen's initiative referendum. Only then can we restore unity to our country when everybody feels respected and heard, when every vote counts, when every voice heard, when everybody has their own representative, including the minorities. Once again, it's not about deciding who will sit at the National Assembly. Minority, minorities should be represented there as well. I also want to revise the Constitution because in my citizens' initiative referendum on immigration, there's going to be a constitutional revision. I will invoke Article 11. I'm stating this very clearly, the same way that General de Gaulle did in 1962. And he explained why. The supreme law of the people it's in our constitution. The only sovereign authority in our country is the people, not the Conseil Constitutionnel. The people is sovereign. And because the constitution is the highest law of the land, only the people get to change it. How do we do that? Through a referendum, particularly when the National Assembly and the Senate are not representative of the French people. Let us love and protect democracy. No. What, what you have just suggested would completely eradicate the National Assembly. That is not at all what I'm doing. No. So you have just put in place a system that would completely sidestep the Parliament. But the scope of such measures would be clearly delineated. So you want to be able to bring in law without going via the National Assembly. So what is the... So that... Uh, what purpose does it serve now? Macron, two minute lead. Mr. Macron, sorry to say this again, but the people are the highest authority. 
and only the people but the assembly can represents them. change the constitution and do it directly. I'd like to remind you that in our constitution, sovereignty belongs to the people and the people exercise the sovereignty via its representatives and via referendum. General de Gaulle used the referendum in 1962. And if it weren't legal, you and I would be talking about things that don't matter because the presidential election would have been illegal since 1962. Obviously, elections are legal and they are democratic. We need to restore democracy, the sense of democracy in our country. And this is how I recharge my batteries. I read the Constitution. I believe in secular, democratic, indivisible, socially driven democracy. I believe, the, I believe in the government of the people, for the people, by the people. Right. Uh, Marine Le Pen, a few minutes uh, behind Emmanuel Macron, I'll, um, we are uh, 15 minutes uh, late, we were to close. You have two minutes, each of you, to convince um, the final swing voters you can um, comply with those conditions. You, please don't interrupt yourself. Emmanuel Macron, you won the toss to conclude first. Thank you. Thank you to Mrs. Le Pen as well for the lively debate that we have had this evening and your party and the history and the political stance of your party is something that uh, uh, I, I take note of, but I also respect you as a person. And this evening we spoke about a number of topics, essential topics for so many of our French citizens. But there were many topics that we weren't able to talk about, such as disabilities, gender equality, our overseas territories. There, I, I could go on and on with such a lengthy list of topics that we did not get to broach. However, yes, we do disagree on a number of topics, but this uh, election is in a way a referendum for the European Union, this partnership between France and Germany. It's a referendum about the environment because you don't agree eye to eye on the environment. It's also a referendum about uh, secularism and fraternity because we don't see eye to eye as we just saw in what you said about uh, the veil. So I believe that on the 21st of April, it's a clear decision that needs to be made. So I have 40 seconds. And I would like to speak about the younger generations, the children, the children who suffered so much through the COVID crisis. And one thing which really carries me forward is that I want to build a better world. And I was elected to do that. And I, if I am elected again, I will continue to do that. While I hear people concerned, sometimes people feel isolated that they will all be part of our political push in the future. And by way of conclusion, I would like to talk to the people of France. Despite the fatigue, uh, the fatigue of the past five years, your purchasing power has gone down, your living conditions have deteriorated, and yet all you want is your peace and quiet. You want a return to common sense in terms of how government affairs are managed. Common sense. We need to help the most vulnerable members of society, disabled individuals, the 25% of families who are single parent families, help them instead of paying those individuals who are lucky enough to pay the wealth tax. Globalization is brutal and it destabilizes the French economy. We need to show common sense and stop the upper level of predators to use tax evasion to plunder our country, but also the delinquents of criminals and felons who harass good people and make their lives hell. We need to protect our welfare system our retirement pensions, our health care system, our unemployment insurance system, so we can cope with difficulties in life. We shouldn't be afraid of the future all the time. We need to stop speculation. 
we need to locally source our supply line. We need to stop uberization. We need to give a priority to the French in their own country for a simple reason. France is the only country we have. And this is the soul of our country. All countries across the world would understand that we are seeking to protect our identity, our landscape, our language, our culture, and to do it without any inhibition. This is a viable and vital platform. This is my platform, a platform I seek to advance for all French people. Well, this brings us to the end of the debate between the two rounds. My thanks to both of you for taking part. Thank you, Gilles. Thank you, Léa. Thank you both for have respected the spirit, the letter of this democratic debate. Thanks for watching. We all hope that this discussion has enlightened you, helped you um, form a view four days before the runoff vote. Very pleasant evening on our two networks. Welcome to our special debrief of what we've just been watching for the past, well, nearly three hours. The two candidates in the French presidential election going head to head, toe to toe. Emmanuel Macron wasting no time in attacking his far right rival Marine Le Pen over her links to Russia. Macron called Russia her banker, a reference to a loan she took out some 11 million euros with a Russian bank to save her party from bankruptcy. Le Pen denied she was in the pocket of the Kremlin. Though she has, of course, praised Vladimir Putin in the past, right up until the war with Ukraine. Many more points to discuss, of course. And the team we have here, of course, the best that France Van Kat can deliver, our sharpest editorial minds. They are Mark Perlman, our French politics editor. Great to see you, sir. Kat Nicholson is our Europe editor. Great to see you, Kat. On the other side, Kate Moody, with all the business. Last but not least, definitely Douglas Herbert, our international affairs commentator. Great to see you, Mark. I have to start with you as the French politics editor. Your thoughts? We saw uh, political boxing, it seemed like, there. Who do you think won? No actual knockout, perhaps it was on points? What it would was you say? not a knockout. Last time it was a knockout for Emmanuel Macron. Uh, Marine Le Pen really uh, failed. She admitted it. It was her worst political moment ever. It didn't happen uh, for her uh, tonight. Obviously, she was uh, challenged by Emmanuel Macron. A number of issues we'll discuss from foreign policy, Europe, retirement, Islam uh, and many other issues, the environment, uh, of course, and uh, the Islamic veil. But the, but the, the veil thing, though, that's, that's really one thing where we found out what we already knew. Yes. He would be for it, she would be against yes. it. Yes. But obviously, Emmanuel Macron used uh, words like civil war and so on. So, yes, we, we, had, we had a face off, but uh, just the optics for Marine Le Pen were much better. Uh, first of all, there were no cutaways, so you didn't see her uh, looking at her nose like last time or uh, making those weird faces and so on. She was more composed. Obviously, uh, sometimes she appeared uncomfortable when numbers were just being thrown around because he's much better at numbers than she is. What did you make of that civil war thing when Macron said that? You know, with your, he said to her, with, with her policy on the veil, she would create, start a civil war. What did you make of that? Well, clearly uh, he is trying to use this because uh, he knows that it's a point where she flip-flopped a bit uh, in the last few days because she was forced to repeat because she had to clarify her position that she would ban uh, the Muslim veil in all public spaces. And uh, because at some point she said, well, maybe not, we'll have to think about it. She had to clarify this, but immediately said, oh, you know, we, we shouldn't spend too much time on this because she wanted maybe to talk about something else, because she knows that legally maybe it's not sustainable and practically it's impossible uh, to implement. And so Emmanuel Macron didn't let go, of course. He said, no, wait a second. This is impossible. This is unfair. This is unconstitutional. And this will create a civil war. Obviously, Emmanuel Macron is also thinking about the undecided voters, especially those who cast a ballot for the far-left leader, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, because he knows that uh, many uh, 
young people, many Muslim people, even though you're not allowed to, uh, the, you know, uh, think in terms of uh, ethical, uh, Secular uh, sorry, ethnical yeah. sure. no, <laughs> origins no, no. in, in you, France, yeah. uh, he knows that 70 percent Uh, of the Muslims voted for uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon. So yes, uh, this is a second round. You have to fight for it, and he used this. It's a bit of red meat, but uh, kind of Macron that's the name of the game. Scooching to the left yes. in some way. Mark, thank you very much indeed. Catherine, can I bring you in? Because Macron concluded there saying it was a referendum in many ways, a selection on the EU. And clearly there are different views of the EU from both candidates. One of the things he said was about reforming the Schengen zone, picking up from what Le Pen was saying about the idea of crime, expelling criminals, uh, basically saying foreign criminals straight back to wherever they live or where they came from or wherever she sees they, they came from. The reform of the Schengen zone, what do you, what do you, what do you see in this? Clearly two different, pers two different ideas there, but obviously m maybe both looking to change in some way. Macron saying he would reform the Schengen zone. Absolutely, yes. And not just the Schengen rules, but uh, the, the rules regarding asylum, how asylum is asked for and dealt with in the EU as well. And I want to say that as the boring person who follows European policy all the time, this hardly, is something that hardly. Macron has been following exciting. for quite a long time. I've followed quite a few of his mm. speeches and it's not something new that he's brought up for the election. Um, and it, it again shows that clear split between Emmanuel Macron, who's saying, He, he, he said, look, Europe, there are problems, there are things that we need to change, there are policies we need to change. Schengen would be one example of those things that he wants to change, but while staying within Europe. And he was trying to get Marine Le Pen to say that she wants out of Europe. She wouldn't say that. She wants to be in Europe. She wants a Europe of nations, she was saying. But I think Emmanuel Macron was trying quite uh, hard to point out, um, as many analysts have done, that what Marine Le Pen is trying to do, the amount of changes that she wants in this Europe of nations, essentially means that, you know, the European Union she's, doesn't exist. She's some of a shapeshifter on Europe, isn't she? She's definitely changed her policy. and She's actually quite open about that as well. And um, when I've interviewed members of her party, the National Rally, they've, I've, I've said to them, you know, you seem to have changed your policy on Frexit. Is that because you've seen how difficult Brexit has been when we remember how protected those negotiations were? And they've said, no, no, it's because we've seen that French public opinion has changed on Brexit. Now, what's changed uh, on Frexit? What's changed their public opinion? Is up to anyone else to decide. But, uh, you know, they're quite open about the fact that they have changed their policies regarding Europe and uh, this issue of a sort of Europe of nations and Marine Le Pen wanting alliances within Europe. Well, she's also shown that as well. Uh, and I think Emmanuel Macron was trying to, again, point out the differences between the, the countries that he wants to have strong alliances with and the governments that she wants to have strong alliances with. Uh, for example, Marine Le Pen, uh, very close to the government of Viktor Orban, who is facing a whole lot of problems within the European Union regarding degradations of rule of law in his country. Emmanuel Macron making no secret of the fact that he wants, as he called it, a strong Franco-German couple. Uh, and uh, he said at one point as well, you know, uh, we created Europe. France is a country that created... And the Airbus too, Franco-German thing, creating yes, Airbus. He, he said that, that too, well. didn't he, as well? <laughs> yeah. Orban, friend of Putin. That's another issue that Orban's got, of course, which puts a bit odds with the EU right now. Kat, thank you. Um, Marine Le Pen talked about bon sens. Common sense, I think, would translate that as K, wouldn't we? And she was thinking about things for French people and obviously this cost of living crisis that all countries are going through. But clearly here in, in France, since the whole Gilets Jaunes uh, movement kicked off and brought into everybody's living room, these images of people really who aren't making ends meet are all struggling. Did you sense from either candidate a real understanding of what the cost of living crisis is about? Well, it's very clear that Marine Le Pen has been following the kinds of people who were out on the streets protesting in those yellow vest pr protests that you were referring to there. These are the people who were protesting against some of Emmanuel Macron's reforms earlier in his mandate. Uh, and they're the ones who are also sometimes saying we really can't make ends meet at the end of every month. She's had this really at the heart of her campaign. Uh, it came out, it did come out in her in her appearance this evening. She talked about it repeatedly about trying to return money to the French people. Um, She repeated these proposals of trying to lower sales tax uh, on petrol, on energy from 20 to five and a half percent. She wants to get rid of sales tax on about 100 basic goods. Uh, and she brought in this proposal of not having, of getting rid of an income tax for people under 30. That's her, tr her ploy to try and keep young French workers within France. Um, Emmanuel Macron did come out stronger on this than he may have done earlier on. He hadn't focused on it much in the short time that he was actually on the campaign. Campaign trail. He did uh, rightly point out that a VAT that a VAT reduction would 
work for everybody, including the better off, in, including on that plat on that set there. Uh, and he's still trying to help the most vulnerable people. That's what he says. Anyway. Kate, thank you. Doug, an international perspective. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, well, first of all, you know, the, the, the moderators of, of, the, of this wanted to actually start um, with Ukraine and the war in Ukraine. They thought that that is the preeminent, you know, the dominant headline uh, story right now. It affects everyone across Europe. That was nixed, reportedly nixed by uh, Marine Le Pen's campaign. They wanted to start with purchasing power, and that was the first, the first item. But it, it's very clear. I mean, for me, that was one of the most salient uh, and, and telling aspects of, of this entire debate in the sense that, you know, Macron really dug in. He really went for, for broke here. We were expecting, we knew that uh, Marine Le Pen was on weak ground with Ukraine. She's, you know, changed her opinion, she says, you know, uh, of Vladimir Putin, uh, you know, following the invasion. But, you know, she has that notoriously, famously ch uh, chummy history with him. She, you know, recognized the annexation, um, uh, you know, of, of Crimea. She was really, Macron pointed out, he, she was like the only prominent European sort of political figure who, you know, accepted the annexation of Crimea, recognized it at the time. She laid into him as well. Uh, he laid into her as well on the bank loan she got from Russia, which has been, you know, rehashed in the press time and again and again. Wouldn't let go of that, but perhaps rightfully so, because she, he really hit her Achilles heel here in the sense that she was unable to really um, acknowledge that in any way, shape or form, the fact that she has taken millions in loans from a bank, which Macron was very quick to point out that she's still paying off. He's obviously really she, done she his research in this he, loan. He referred to Russia as her it, banker. As her banker. And, and she was criticizing him about meeting Putin. And he she, said, exactly. And she was saying it's not the same thing. He says, not my you, banker. Exactly. Yeah. He's basically saying to her, listen, you're answer, answerable to Russian creditors, to Russian bankers. And it's not the same. I'm, I'm a president. I'm right now. I have an obligation to reach out to these leaders. He did the same with Trump. I have an obligation as the head of state to try, if I see, uh, you know, uh, an opportunity, a window to do so, to have to open dialogue, keep dialogue open with leaders, even those who I consider staunch adversaries, those whom I have the most vehement disagreements with. Uh, Marine Le Pen would not basically um, admit or concede in any way to Emmanuel Macron that her ability to negotiate as he would see it on equal footing with Russia, that is to not be beholden to Russia or be their hostage in a sense, uh, was not in any way influenced by the fact that she took a loan out. But on a little things, I just wanted to, one last thought for you. You've was got that, time, Doug. Go yeah, ahead. Five years ago, you know, uh, on the over the general impression here, five years ago, I do think this would have been seen as a knockout for Macron, objectively speaking, a knockout, because um, Marine Le Pen time and again was factually very sloppy, factually challenged might be a more euphemistic way of putting it. Um, he really laid into her and he, he clearly had a, a better uh, mastery of a lot of the dossiers, if you will, of a lot of the, the different topics. Um, it's a, perhaps an indicator of just how much France's political landscape has lurched to the right. And it's not even talked about that much now. And, 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 and the fact that, and we have talked about the fact that Marine Le Pen has become acceptable, has been mainstreamed in a sense. The fact that this, this debate now, in hindsight, is going to be judged much more on an equal footing. People are going to be able, giving her much more the benefit of the doubt. They're going to say she performed very well, when in fact, qualitatively speaking, she really did not uh, perform that much better than she did five years ago, if at all. I mean, we might have said five years ago, my first reaction coming out of it would be that uh, Macron wiped the floor with Marine Le Pen on a lot of issues, whether we're talking immigration, whether we're talking Russia, Ukraine, whether we're talking en um, environment, whether we're talking debt, taxes, so on and so forth, or even uh, even the, the uh, headscarf, the Islamic veil. Um, so I think it's an indication how much things have changed here. There's a prominent uh, French political analyst, Dominique Moisy, he comes on France 24 occasionally. He called this the election of fear versus anger. And he said this is going to come down. The question when going into this debate and into the election is going to come down to do you hate Emmanuel Macron more than you fear Marine Le Pen? That's not his question. It's the question that he says many French are going to ask themselves. And that's really an indication of what I see as in this debate, going into this debate, whatever you think of Macron, he was damned if he does, he's damned if he doesn't. If he tries to factually set, set straight uh, uh, a cynical demagogue, which is essentially what Marine Le Pen is, even though we're not technically allowed to say that, if he tries to set her straight, he risks, as we were discussing before this debate, coming across as aloof, as haughty, as arrogant, as professorial, as trying to put her in her place. Doug, thank that you. That was his big issue here. Doug, thank you very much indeed. Let's bring back in Mark Perlman, our French politics editor. Um, some might say that Marine Le Pen did better, Doug was saying not. But some would say she did better, and those might say, well, yeah, she had five years to prepare, didn't she? As you pointed out, last time it would have been to use the boxing parlance and knock out to Macron. This time it might be a victory on points. Where are the points you think where Macron scored highest? Where are the points where Le Pen did better? 
Well, I, I think uh, on the whole, uh, clearly um, Macron has a mastery of, you know, all the different issues that Le Pen uh, still doesn't have, even after five years of, of prepping and so on, even on legal issues. She's a lawyer by training. Her uh, argument about uh, the referendum, you know, that I want to use the referendum because it's the people, they decide, so they're above the Constitution. That's a serious problem legally. And uh, so even though she's a lawyer by training, uh, she's not that uh, solid. Uh, but that's that's for her. It's, it's, it's besides the point, because she knows that, according to the polls, 70, that's two thirds of the French vote on the right or on the far right. And yes, the land has shifted politically. Mm -hmm. So even though uh, the argument about the, the Muslim veil or might also ap appear to be shaky and so on, uh, her harping about building more prisons, about sending people home if they don't belong to France for legal reasons or criminal reasons and so on, uh, this rings a bell with a lot of people, more and more people. It, That's, you know, the, the far right uh, scored a third of the votes in the first round. And there was even someone who was to the right of Marine Le Pen. Let's not forget about that. And so uh, this is why this will be judged differently, because even Emmanuel Macron, you know, the Emmanuel Macron from 2017, yes, he was really to the center. Now he's clearly to the center right. Some might even say he's replaced the Conservative Party. So that, that that's what you have. And so that's why the, the lens that we're using today, or like the French are using, because we don't really matter in that, the French who will cast a ballot on a Sunday uh, are the ones that are important for both Emmanuel Macron and Marine Le Pen. They see things uh, differently. Uh, Emmanuel Macron uh, can benefit from his presidential aura or whatever, because people say, OK, COVID was at the beginning, it was a problem, so on. But in the end, you know, he protected us. He paid for everything and he attacked. He really attacked Marine Le Pen and saying, oh, OK, we have 600 uh, billion euros in debt. But why did you oppose it? You know, well, what would you have done? I, you know, I paid for this. I saved my country, their jobs, their health and so on. And that's, you know, so so clearly uh, Emmanuel Macron can say, OK, I, I went through COVID. I went through the yellow vest, even though that might not be something he's proud of. And I went through the war in Ukraine. I'm still there. And it's true that the polls are indicating, because that's also an important uh, factor, that he has a 13 point lead over uh, Marine Le Pen. That's uh, way more than than he would need uh, to be reelected, obviously not as last time when he garnered two thirds of uh, the votes. But uh, if you add the polls and the performance tonight, something might still happen until Sunday, but there's no reason uh, not to think after the debate tonight that Emmanuel Macron is still not in the best position to be re-elected. You have an exciting job as our French politics editor, <laughs> Mike. You can see the passion oozing with every word that you're saying there. It's fantastic stuff. Remarkable shift to the far right here in France, though, which you've noted there from 2002 when it was 80% to 20. Now it's it's incredibly close, isn't it? It's, it is it's a because 55-45, it, or it's a, real shift. A victory it's, a real, it's a real shift in society, isn't it? That's something to note. And of course, that's been reflected across Europe too, hasn't it? There's a, a real sense across Europe, a growing sense of these kind of Trump-esque, Le Pen-esque kind of characters trying to sort of go for this so-and-so wherever I live first policy. Yeah, I mean, it's quite a mixed picture and things have come and gone over the last few years, I think we can say. There was certainly a time uh, when, for example, in Central Europe, uh, there was in what's known as the Visegrad group of four countries, uh, Hungary, Poland, Czech Republic and Slovakia, there were some... Uh, leaders who were really going for this um, sort of nationalistic outlook. This was particularly seen during the peak of the migration uh, crisis in 2015-16. Things have ebbed and flowed a little bit since then, though. And we've seen, for example, in Germany, in the most recent elections, you know, we've got this uh, traffic light coalition, as it's known, of the, the Social Democrats, the Liberals and the Greens now in government. Angela Merkel's party uh, really pushed out a government and uh, the, the far right party Party in Germany not making any progress at all. In Portugal, uh, you've got the left uh, winning, coming back into power once again. So I think um, something that we can definitely note all around Europe is that where there have been traditional party splits, uh, like 
in France where you've had traditionally the sort of the Gaullist party, the Nicolas Sarkozy party versus the Socialist party, the François Hollande, and it's sort of flip-flop between those two. That is absolutely fracturing all over Europe at this point. We can see it in, in so many countries. And let's face it, here in France, we've got Emmanuel Macron, who's leading his own political party that didn't exist six years ago, yeah. against Marine Le Pen, who's from the far right, consi considered a, 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 would have been considered a pariah 20, 25 years ago, right there in second place. As Mark said, you know, uh, Eric Zemmour, also from the far right, polling pretty well, really. Uh, and Jean-Luc Mélenchon, the far left candidate, just destroying the traditional socialist party uh, who didn't even get their deposit back after the first round. And I think that that's very much part of a trend that we are seeing around Europe. Indeed, the so-called parties of power basically going politically and sometimes financially bankrupt. Kat, thank you. Kate, can I bring you in? Pension reform is an explosive topic here, isn't it? And we heard, of course, the row about how long we're all going to work till. Some of us might work till the 90s because they've got too many kids. But, you know, the, the talk here is about 64, 65, 62. Can you clarify this for us? Well, remember that the current retirement age in France is 62, uh, and there are 42 different special pension retirement schemes. How many? France. 42, Mark. 42? Absolutely. Ooh. So that's, what, so that's what, what both candidates are dealing with here. Uh, Macron, we know, tried to reform the pension system in his first mandate. Uh, he was trying to push the retirement age up to 65. He has doubled down on that. He says that even though those reforms had to grind to a halt over the last few years, he would go ahead with trying to reform the system. Uh, he said event, he, he softened his stance a little bit on the age because that's been very controversial. He said, you know, eventually we'll have to probably work until we're 65. But, you know, first of all, why don't we try to aim for 64? Uh, he did call out Marine Le Pen, who she's been she's been campaigning on this platform of I'm going to lower the retirement age to 60 or 62 for people who've been working for 40 years. But actually, if you look at her platform, the, the official retirement age does go from 60 to 67. So quite a wide discrepancy there. It was one of the moments uh, where he really called her out on the numbers. It's something that Doug was referring to there. Uh, that when she was trying to come up with numbers to, to nail him on the, the this data about the economy that he's been running for the last five years, he, she seemed a little bit flummoxed when it come to, when it comes to those actual figures. Uh, when we were talking about the the cost of living crisis, right? It's supposed to be one of the real powerhouses of her campaign this time around. And she said, "I would really take I would really take action uh, when inflation is outstripping GDP growth by one percentage point. We're absolutely in that situation right now." And he said, hang on a minute, what figures are you looking at? Because I've got my the figures from the Bank of France right here. And I mean, the numbers that we're looking at here in this particular case, the Bank of France forecast for inflation for this year is 4.4 percent. GDP is forecast currently to grow 3.4 percent. So everyone's acknowledging here that inflation is very high, that this is a real problem. But he was sort of saying, you know, you sit, you're trying to make this sound worse than it is. So what, again, when it came to the cost of living, when it came to pensions, these issues that she's really been campaigning on far and wide as she's been trying to, you know, boost her popularity in the few, last few weeks, he kept coming back to the numbers and saying, you don't really have a grasp of this. Indeed, but there are going to be families and some people perhaps watching this program who can't make ends meet, who are struggling, who are having big problems. Do you sense that either candidate really understands what an average family is going through? I'm thinking perhaps of Le Pen's background, which is a little bit more well off, although she tries to sell herself as the the voice of the little man or whatever, whereas Macron is from like a more humble background, but nonetheless someone who's incredibly successful and some would say rich. And he gets criticised for being president of the rich. She, of course, had her own brand of champagne for her celebrations, didn't she? So there's all sorts of French contradictions going on. There are, absolutely. And they both went to quite a lot of pain, actually, really, to say, you know, the French people that I've been out talking to, she had a lot of references uh, to the fishermen, to the mm. farmers that she's been talking to for the last few weeks, but also really the last five years since she lost this election. Uh, he name-checked a few French citizens that he's spoken to a lot, uh, that he, you know, that he tried to use as examples of people that he is, feels really in contact with. Um, I think that he came out stronger with his cost of living proposals than he might have shown in that run up to this debate. Uh, she repeated the same kinds of things that we'd heard from her before. Macron maybe had a bit of a, a, a bit of a, a of, of, a, of an advantage when it came to that, because he was saying, look, 
my real priority is going to be getting people to work and then boosting their salaries so that they can deal with this cost of living. I don't want to just give them handouts. Um, you know, it, it was a central topic, and we heard them coming back to it over and over and over, and again, trying to make themselves seem as close to the French electorate as possible. Indeed. Kate, thank you very much. Just we're trying to be equal in how we're debating this. In the debate, of course, they have the equal timing. I'm told that our timing is equal as well, so <laughs> we're doing very well at the moment. <laughs> Doug, can I bring you in? Yeah, I just want to say about the, uh, just go ahead, go ahead. That. Because such a theme of this, right, is um, the sense of Macron uh, or his detractor saying he's out of touch with the people. You know, he's he works for bankers. He is aloof. He's rich. He's a, he's the president for the rich. He's, he's, he, the, he's the one from the, from the well, more normal background, well, isn't he? There are a couple, well, not just that, but what's interesting is during the five years of his presidency, and he pointed this out early in the debate, he said that, and, and my sort of my, my, uh, my eyes opened wide. He said, I've gone to 600 different, you know, I've crisscrossed France going to 600 different towns and because Marine Le Pen was trying to make it sound like he was a president only stuck to the rich and the, the, the bourgeois, the bobos, as the French would call them in the big cities. Um, and he was trying to sort of fight back at that, that he's this out of touch image of himself. Um, just throwing that number out there, the hundreds. And you'll remember during the Gilets Jaunes uh, crisis, which we don't really talk, it hasn't even been talked about that much, but he literally, you know, took time out from his presidency. And he had these marathon sessions, if you remember, um, day after day after day. Sometimes they would laugh seven, eight, uh, nine hours where he would literally sit there in these small village halls or town halls throughout France, uh, basically having to take the blows, absorb whatever people and had to give And he went back on that price hike on diesel, which kicked it all off. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So he's still been stigmatized. I was going to ask you about Ukraine. Is it going to be uh, Marine Le Pen's Achilles heel, her relationship with Putin, alleged, her loan from the banks? Yeah. Fact. Well, look, she's already said in this campaign. I mean, it's not me saying it. It's she, black and white. She said uh, last week that she wants to, as soon as this war is over, as soon as what she said is a peace treaty is signed. I don't know what the parameters of, would be with that. But as soon as a peace treaty is signed, the war is over. She wants, uh, you know, Europe and, and France to get back on board with Russia. She doesn't want Russia to, to be alienated. She believes uh, that they need to have a strong relationship, if anything, to hold China at bay, or at least to hold off the prospect of a closer, more closely bonded Russia and China. Um, so there's this sense, though, that, you know, th this tropism, if you will, it's like a plant, you know, mm -hmm. growing up towards Russia is going to perhaps come at the expense of Ukraine. Now, let's be clear. She was adamant. She started the entire debate with a mea culpa, not, not a mea culpa, that's the wrong word, trying to drive home the point because you could hear, you could almost hear the debate preparation here where her, her team was saying, the first words that come out of your mouth in this debate have to be about how much you support Ukraine and the Ukrainian people because she knew that's where she was on the shakiest ground. That's, she knew that Macron that was going to have an easy in for attacking her there. So her debate team, you can be sure of it, were saying to her, you get right out of there. The first words I want to hear out of your mouth are about Ukraine and how much you're in solidarity she's, with she's Ukraine. The people. attack's not acceptable, she said to, about, to Macron, your but efforts deserve our support, etc., exactly. etc. Et but at yeah. the end of the day, yeah. just to, at the end of the day, uh, despite those fine words of support and solidarity for Ukraine, her historical sympathies lie with Russia. Those are hard to change overnight, and she could say as much as she wants that her opinion has, quote, changed about Vladimir Putin since the invasion uh, by Russia of Ukraine. But in fact, uh, if she were elected, you can pretty much count on the fact that she would have uh, building sympathies for Russia. And she, she has said tonight, she explicitly said it, the, she uh, spoke about the importance of having a tight relationship with Russia. Regardless, no one really asked her, Macron didn't ask her, but even with a potentially criminal regime of Vladimir Putin, if war crimes tribunals, if investigators were to bear out evidence showing that, yes, in fact, Russia is guilty of war crimes. That hasn't been done yet, but if it were to happen. But nonetheless, like you say, I think you're using the right terminology in terms of describing Russia at the moment because this is a state that has invaded another state with no justification. So I think you're There's on. There's no other terminology. I think you're on, you're on solid ground, Doug, completely. Mark, yeah, can I bring uh, you? Oh, go ahead, Mark, please. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I go think ahead. like Emmanuel Macron went, went further than that. I mean, he, he attacked her uh, for essentially uh, being dependent yeah. on mm -hmm. the goodwill of her banker. And he, he didn't just say she got money from a Russian bank. He said, you got money from a Russian bank linked to, he didn't cite Vladimir Putin, but he said it's linked to, you know, the power structure in Russia. So this means, and for a leader presenting herself as French, independent, sovereign, you hear the, you know, the discourse has been there Ooh, sure, for years. Sure, sure. He clearly said that 
she is not representing France when it comes to Russia or even Europe. She is, in effect, representing a France tied to Vladimir Putin because of her financial dependence. So it's a much more serious uh, at attack Same on... Same with Trump, right? Same thing they said about Trump, that he was beholden to Putin. Exactly. He's he not representing America. So, no, and she probably didn't expect such a direct attack, because this was the second issue of the, the debate. Something... He knew it was coming, but maybe not as violently as it came. There's something interesting about that whole issue with the Russian loan. I'm sure Marine Le Pen knew that was coming. Um, and she was saying, oh, I had to take a loan from a Russian bank because no bank in France would lend to me. You, Macron, promised to bring in this uh, democratic bank system, uh, which would do away with this sort of thing. And he fired back that Eric Zemmour, who's further to the right of Marine Le Pen, he managed uh, to finance his campaign without needing to go to Russia. Um, I feel like that was a detail that just kind of slipped by, but it was just quite an interesting well, I'm glad one you brought it back. Because uh, this issue of the, the Russian loan situation, you know, it's, it's very much been hanging around in the ether for a long time. And that has always been the response that Marine Le Pen has given. You know, no French bank would lend to me. What am I supposed to do? Did she go as far as to say that it was Macron as economy minister or banking minister who actually blocked that happening? Mm, she, did, did I imagine that? that? No, did that did happen, that didn't he, it? Yeah, he, yeah. Well, this bank of democracy, because, yes, they're, they're, she, she, I mean, the, na the National Rally or before that, the National Absolutely. Fund, they've always had a finance problem. And sometimes they take money from the European Union. That's another story. But, yes, it's true. They couldn't find <laughs> any... court case. The, the, yeah. No, but they couldn't find any French bank to, to finance them, mm. whether mm -hmm. uh, the banks were being told by uh, others, you know, you shouldn't lend, because, you know, Marine Le Pen, it's, it's true that the times have changed, but she was a pariah, including for banks, you know, and so, yes, she had to go somewhere else. The problem is uh, probably she knocked on the wrong door. And, and the other interesting thing that she did say in regards to Russia about that was she supports all most of the sanctions that have been levied against Moscow, but notably she does not support a potential embargo on Russian mm -hmm. oil. Right. That was something that slipped in there as well. She tried to tie it back again to that protecting the French people. I don't want them to have to pay more for energy, but it was a really key point there uh, and something that really makes her stand out because that is not at all the trend that we're seeing across other European economies. And France is one of the economies. European countries that is less dependent on Russian energy thanks to the nuclear power. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. She's used that, that same issue to sort of talk about protecting French farmers too, hasn't she? Sort of, we, we can't stop that because it will affect the farmers. We can't stop that, it will affect ordinary families. We can't stop that because it might hurt my banker. No, no, I'm not going to say she that. She called it harakiri. She said we shouldn't pre perform harakiri on ourselves, you know, like a suicidal act that would bounce back and hurt us more than it, it would hurt Russia. Okay, we're getting towards the end of our debrief. I want to go around all four of you and just get a sense of how you think it is going to go. Uh, I'm saying you to last, Mark, because you're our French politics guru. You're going last. Doug, how's it going to go between now and Sunday? Well, I, you know, I have to go back to what Mark was saying. I mean, you know, he has a sizable, if you're to believe the polls, or uh, he has a sizable lead. There was nothing tonight that would you would have undercut that lead. In other words, he didn't do more damage to himself. It wasn't a... a it was by far not a disastrous performance, you know, even, you know, as worst critics could say, he held steady at best. Um, so, but like I said, the, the political climate has changed in France. The way people perceive these debates and the way they are going to be judged has changed radically. And the, that, what I was talking about before, that fear versus anger factor, you know, I was, I was looking through a lot of the Twitter discussion around this debate as it was going on here in France. I mean, it was visceral, visceral attacks, you know, even at times... A lot against Emmanuel Macron, you know, going back mm -hmm. to what I was saying, you, you really see that hatred coming out um, on a lot of this social media. Um, you can't, so you could obviously say, fine, social media is not representative, Twitter is not representative of French it's public a, opinion. It's a but, bit of a viper's nest, social media, though, but, isn't it? But whoever you are. You it's, a, it's a viper's nest. But like I said, I think it was, you know, the fact that it, it, it's going to be an election that he probably pulls off, ekes out a victory here. But I do think it's going to be a much heavier, heavier lift than it sh would have been and should have been under much different political circumstances. Vladimir Zelensky saying vote Macron. Alexei Navalny actually pointing well, out. He didn't say vote Macron. He, he said he would find it perhaps easiest to be able to continue Thank working. Thank you for the correction, Doug. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's yeah. very prescient. And you had Alexei Navalny speaking from his jail cell. Yes. Now that was Alexei Navalny. Tell uh, us what he said. Yeah, just as recess. Basically what he did is he, uh, he, he urged French to, to go vote for Macron. He is writing. It was a long thread today. And then he also. I got you uh, to say that was before I made the same mistake. <laughs> Thank you. Went off on another tangent. But he said beyond just voting for Macron, he basically did, he did what uh, he, he, it was a vote. He was telling people why they should not 
vote for Le Pen. And his argument was like a lot of French say, you know, they're conservative and they can identify with the conservative policies and Putin's conservatism on family values and a whole bunch of it. He says that is all bogus. If you're voting for Marine Le Pen because she's allied with Putin and they espouse or embrace conservative values, you're voting for all the wrong reasons because what you think is conservatism is really masquerading as corruption. These are corrupt people. They don't deserve your vote. So it was vote for Macron and please do not vote for Le Pen because it would be a vote for corruption um, and dishonesty. Yes, yes that, that public image of Putin doesn't really stack up, does it? From the European side of it all. Oh, I think that both of them showed uh, exactly what we thought we were going to get from them. Emmanuel Macron flying a blue flag with yellow stars on it, practically. Uh, and Marine Le Pen setting out and standing by her Europe of Nations idea very firmly. I think that the, the pro-Europeans in France uh, will see Emmanuel Macron as, as probably their natural choice. And uh, people who want a looser uh, alliance with other European nations will go with Marine Le Pen. I think they made it pretty clear how big and how fundamental their difference is. Kate. Look, 10 days ago, 60 percent of French voters said cost of living was their top priority. I don't think that's going to change between now and the second round. I think that Perhaps the lower income households who may have been leaning towards Le Pen might have been reassured by Macron's slightly more concrete offers to try to help them out of the situation at the moment. Um, but she is still really, really reaching to that very specific demographic there. Uh, she may have lost a little bit of credibility when it came to those numbers. I think anyone who's really worried about their, about their spending power, about the, this, cri this crisis in the cost of living and about the French economy may give the edge to Macron. Never a numbers crisis with Kate. Thank you very much indeed. Mark, we, I'm told we've got one minute left. I'm giving you two for parity. Go ahead, sir. <laughs> well, uh, I don't think the polls are going to move much after this debate. 12-point mm. lead for uh, Macron. The campaign ends in 48 hours, so I don't expect anything major uh, to happen. What will be uh, really important is abstention. Some are expecting record high abstention uh, because... Uh, many of the voters are not happy with either Macron or uh, Le Pen and would rather stay home or go fishing on, on Sunday. Um, so that's that's the, the, the one of the keys. The other is uh, the 22 percent who voted for uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon. Jean-Luc Mélenchon has told them uh, not a single vote for uh, Marine Le Pen. Then a few days ago, he said, well, do not abstain. So they could either vote blank or vote uh, for uh, Emmanuel Macron. That's why uh, you had uh, Emmanuel Macron try to seize on this, saying, you know, I want a greener presidency. I don't want to ban uh, the veil. And why Marine Le Pen is always talking about, you know, the modest uh, French and uh, how to improve their uh, daily life. So this this will be really uh, the decisive uh, factor in the, the coming days. This debate was important because we had a shortened campaign because of COVID, because of Ukraine, because of Macron's choice to wait until the very last minute uh, to begin to uh, campaign. Uh, probably uh, if a difference was made, it's uh, between the first round and today when he increased, he doubled his lead over uh, Marine Le Pen. And I don't see why tonight's debate would change that. One man who won't be going fishing on Sunday, Mark Perlman, our French <laughs> politics editor. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thanks to Kat Nicholson, our Europe editor. Thanks to Kate with the business, as always. And thanks to Douglas Herbert, our international affairs commentator. What a briefing we've had for you. Uh, our coverage, of course, continues right up until voting day on Sunday. Stay with us here in France 24. Thank you, sir. France 24 and RFI in partnership with France 2 and France Inter with Ipsos Soprasteria. Special event. Who will be France's next president? We're counting down to the second round of the presidential election on April 24th. How close? Our campaign coverage kicks off from 7 p.m. Paris time. We'll be crossing the campaign headquarters to our correspondents throughout France and around the world. First results from 8 p.m. Our election night coverage continues at 10 p.m. with analysis, reporting, and reaction from both candidates and kingmakers. How will this election change France? What will be its impact on Europe and the wider world? Join us for our second and final round election coverage here on France 24 and France24.com.